It's challenge time, Infographics fans. You just won the Ultra Mega Jackpot, and after taxes, your bank account now reads $1 billion. But there's a catch. You have to spend it all, every single cent, in one day, or you'll lose it and everything you bought with it. Think you could do it? Hello and welcome to a special challenge episode of the Infographics Show. Spend $1 billion in one day. The rules are simple. You have to spend every dollar in 24 hours or you have to return everything you bought or spent along with the leftovers. For added incentive, if you fail the challenge, the money goes to an organization dedicated to kicking kittens. And one billion will buy a lot of innocent kittens to kick. So you better not fail. You can't give any of the money away as a donation or gift. It has to be spent on something that's just for you or perhaps you and a few friends at the max. So no copping out by buying the entire infographic show staff. $50 $50 million gift cards to in and out which of course we know you would do because you love us and in and out is pretty much the best. So time to get greedy. Much like the late and great Richard Pryor in Brewster's Millions, the clock is ticking and time is running out. Without further ado, here's our purchases. Think you can do better? Stay tuned and then give us your list in the comments. 1. Naturally, the first thing most people are going to think about is buying a home. Real estate is a solid investment after all, and there's quite a few very hefty cash sinks that can quickly eat up a billion dollars. But why start at a home? We've got a billion dollars, it's time to think bigger. Like private island big. All the open space you could want, no neighbors whatsoever to worry about, and no pesky homeowners association telling you to take down your Halloween decorations because it's April. Halloween is a year-round celebration, or at least it should be. And with your own private island, it will be. The United Arab Emirates offers a wide variety of artificially built islands all for sale, and with Al Marjan Island up for grabs at $462 million, that's an easy get that takes care of nearly half your budget. The island features an airstrip, several beaches, and power provided from the mainland. Truly a picturesque and perfect man-made paradise. With just one slight catch, it's located at the very tip of the Gulf of Oman and the Persian Gulf, and if you thought your current neighbors were a pain, just imagine having a Iran is your next door neighbor barely 100 miles away. With constant threats against shipping in the Persian Gulf from Iran, Al Marjan Island may not be the safest place to live, but for now it's a sunny island paradise and next door to beautiful Dubai. So much like America in the 2016 election, we're just going to go with it. What's the worst that can happen? That takes care of $462 million and leaves us with $538 million to go. Two. We just bought a private island in a potential war zone, so naturally the next thing we need to do is make sure our little slice of heaven is well protected. Normal security isn't going to cut it though. After all, you have an entire island to defend against one of the region's most formidable militaries. It's time to hire the best, or at least the most controversial and brutal. It's time for Blackwater. Made notorious after reports of their cowboy attitude and disregard for civilian collateral damage during their involvement in Iraq, Blackwater Security changed its name to Academy, which we guess sounds less thuggish? Well, at $1,222 a day, these guys aren't going to be sitting around reading books. But to defend an island the size of El Marjan, you're going to need at least, let's say, two platoons of hired killers, or 60 mercenaries total. That brings total cost to about $73,000 per day, or $2 million per month worth. With potentially two years left in Donald Trump's presidency and a possible re-election after that, let's go ahead and secure a six-year contract to make our new home safe, which brings the total to $158 million dollars. But hey, you can't put a price on safety, and you'll be keeping Blackwater employees too busy to be shooting innocent civilians, which is borderline charity. But we'll let this one pass. That brings our total expenses to $620 million, leaving us with $380 million. Three. We've got our own island, and we've got our own bloodthirsty crew of hired mercenaries to stop anyone from getting on that island we don't want there. Now it's time to build a home, somewhere modest and cozy where we can lay our head after a long day being grateful war with Iran hasn't broken out yet. Maybe something like the Playboy Mansion? Sadly, if you're a fan of the late Hefners, his home is already sold for $100 million, which was half the original asking price. But why not just build your own? Current construction costs in Dubai range from 6,500 to 8,000 Emirati dirhams per square foot, which is about $1,770 to $2,178 US. Let's 
say you wanted to recreate the Playboy Mansion on your new island. We're pretty sure homes aren't copyrighted, just how much would that cost? The original bunny house is 20,000 square feet. And let's say you do like most builders in Dubai and use cheap foreign labor from East Asia whom you pay slave wages to while treating them like actual slaves, including stealing their passports and threatening to imprison them if they complain about working 12 plus hours in 120 degree heat. So let's go with the low end estimate of 6,500 dirhams per square footage, or $1,770 US. That's going to cost you a whopping $35,400,000 for your own Hugh Hefner Dicks. But who can put a price on a home? That brings our new total to 655,400,000, leaving us with 344,600,000. 4. We're going to need a way to get to our fancy new digs all the way in Dubai, so we'll be skipping that fancy car. Remember how our island came with a private landing strip? That's right, it's time to buy our own jet. But not just any jet, we want a jet with class, style, and some history behind it. So we're going to buy Donald Trump's Boeing 757, selling at $100 million. While a regular Boeing 757 can fit 200 normals, Trump has had his refurbished to accommodate only 23 human beings who fly through the air in the lap of gold-encrusted luxury. With two bedrooms, which will be immediately sanitizing, a private guest room, also sanitizing, a dining room, and a video room with a built-in cinema system, you'll be getting to your island home in absolute style. Flying ain't cheap though, and Trump's operating cost used to run at $10,800 per flight hour, which includes crew and fuel. So to make sure you can keep your jet operational, let's go ahead and contract out enough fuel and crew to last at least 300 flight hours, for a total cost of $3,240,000. Combined with the $100 million price tag, that brings the total cost to $103,240,000, making our new total expenses $824,100,000 180,000 and leaving us with 175,820,000. 5. Flying is nice, but we feel a call for the open seas, and you're not really ultra rich until you own a yacht, right? Unfortunately, with only 175 million left, we can't afford one of the world's top 10 most expensive yachts. But after our purchase of Trump's old Mile High Club airliner, we're pretty much done with buying used, it's time to buy new. Per Forbes, building a yacht used to cost about 1000 per meter 100 years ago, but that price is now ballooned to a whopping $1 million per meter. Then of course there's the cost of crew and fuel, so let's go with a more conservative approach and buy ourselves a 170 meter yacht, which is about 15 meters longer than an American Aegis Destroyer. That brings us to a $170 million price tag, but our fancy new yacht, the SS Infographics, isn't going to go anywhere without crew, insurance, and fuel. Annual fuel costs for a super yacht run about $400,000, with $350,000 in dockage fees if you choose to dock your yacht in foreign ports, $240,000 for insurance, $1 million for maintenance, $1.4 million for crew salaries. That brings us to $3.39 million bringing our total cost to $173,390,000. That brings our total expenses, so far, to $997,570,000. That leaves us with just barely $3.5 million, which lucky for us is enough to top off our shopping spree with the perfect gift for that special someone we'll be sharing our heavily fortified island home with a $3.5 million diamond engagement ring from Cartier Jewelers. Or maybe we'll just keep it for ourselves. Don't judge us, we like to feel pretty too. We're back at it again, subjecting one of our staff writers to your most pressing questions. And this time, it's one that's been asked hundreds of times. What happens when you don't sleep for a week? During our preliminary research, we discovered that the effects of complete sleep deprivation can be pretty severe. So instead of complete no sleep, we're letting our writer and guinea pig get three hours of sleep every day. Well below the recommended eight hours of sleep a night every person should get. Ever wonder what lack of sleep does to the body? According to the American Psychological Association, only 20% of adults get a good quality sleep each night. Yet in 1942, only 8% of people reported getting only six hours or fewer of sleep a night. But in 2017, almost 50% of Americans are getting less than eight hours of sleep. Clearly, we have a serious problem in our society. But how badly is it affecting us? Day one. 
10 a.m. Today I start the No Sleep One Week Challenge, or Little Sleep I suppose, since no sleep can be pretty dangerous, even outright fatal. During my preparation for the challenge I read about American and Soviet sleep deprivation interrogation techniques, where CIA and Soviet gulag prisoners would be sleep deprived for days on end, in order to break down a tough prisoner's mental defenses and extract critical information. Apparently the brain can be so badly affected however that information can be unreliable, or just completely made up, which kind of begs the question of just how effective these techniques really are. I guess I'll find out. In order to test the effectiveness of CIA and Soviet sleep deprivation interrogation techniques, I've struck a deal with my girlfriend. I will hide her laptop somewhere, and she has until day 7 to extract the location from me. Without the laptop, she won't be able to watch Netflix or mess with her Pinterest, and she hates doing work emails from her phone because the screen is so small, so she has a huge incentive to try to get me to break. I guess we'll see if she can. 10 PM. Last night I had a full night's sleep, so I'm not feeling too rough. It's about 10 PM now, and I'm tired, but I've definitely done longer stints without sleep during my years in the military. Working on my laptop and girlfriend asked if she could borrow it, but I told her that that would violate the terms of our challenge. She rolled her eyes and started watching Netflix on her phone. I'm not noticing any side effects so far, but it's going to be a tough to stay awake when nobody else is up. I downloaded a few PS1 games to play through the night and keep me busy though. Day 2 10 AM. Slept my 3 hours. Then I woke up when girlfriend was getting ready for work. Waking up was pretty tough, but again, nothing I haven't experienced before. I'm not really hungry though and haven't eaten yet, and I remember this as a symptom of not sleeping from my time in the military. We used to take Adderall to power through days and days of little sleep. It's basically an amphetamine and jolts your system awake by giving you a ton of energy, but the side effects are pretty terrible. This time, there's no Adderall to cheat with, but from what I've read, the symptoms of no sleep can be just as bad. Guess we'll see. 10 PM. I wasn't that tired last night, but but this time I'm really tired. I brought in a patio chair to sit on because I'm afraid that if I sit on the couch or lay in bed for too long I'll fall asleep. In the military it was easier not to sleep if you were active and had something to do, but with nothing really to do it's a lot harder. I took Dog for a million walks today, and we'll probably take him on at least two more tonight just to keep active. Girlfriend asked me where the laptop was, didn't tell her. Not writing it here either just in case she steals my laptop when I'm not looking. I think watching YouTube and Netflix on her phone is getting to her more than my lack of sleep is getting to me. Research which I read up on says that one of the first effects of sleep deprivation is the inability to show positive emotion on the face. Even happy people can't show it on their face with a smile. I asked my girlfriend if she felt that I was being this way, and she said I laugh less and don't smile as much, but I just seem normal, just really tired. Research also said I'd crave junk food as the body looks for sources of energy to keep itself going. That's definitely true. I drank one of those huge 16 ounce cokes a little bit ago, and will probably drink another later tonight to help me stay up. Sorry washboard abs, you're gonna have to wait at least one more week. Day 3. 10 AM. I woke up after 3 hours and it literally felt like I had just gone to sleep a moment ago. I can't describe how tired I am, not hungry at all. Going to try to keep busy today working on other scripts to pass the time. 10 PM. Definitely an advantage to have something to keep you physically active and alert like in the military, as opposed to just doing nothing. Tried to keep occupied with video games, but the action is getting harder to track. Tried to work on scripts to pass the time, but just too hard to concentrate. Been zoning out a lot, missed an entire conversation after girlfriend came home from work. Research says this is the brain trying to force rest period even with your eyes open. You literally just check out mentally. It's called microsleeps and is supposed to happen less than 30 seconds. Pretty sure I microslept for a full 5 minute conversation. Girlfriend grilled me about her laptop. Didn't tell her. She'll never break me. Day 4. 10 AM. I feel like I haven't eaten in a long time, but I'm hungry. Girlfriend brought me a bunch of nutrition bars yesterday because I haven't been eating much regular food. She left them all over the house so there's always one in reach. Sometimes I eat one and then forget I just ate one and then reach for one only to find the empty wrapper and I realize I just ate one. I think that last sentence makes sense. Getting harder to concentrate but trying hard. Girlfriend had to shake me awake when the alarm rang after 3 hours. She said she's concerned and thinks this is stupid and she's not going to wake me up again, so I had to set 3 alarms just to make sure I wake up. 10 PM. I feel physically ill, like nauseous all the time. I walked the dog earlier and zoned out for I don't know how long. Guess I micro slept in the middle of the sidewalk. Definitely not smiling or laughing much, also making a lot of spelling errors in this document. Hard to concentrate. Research says lack of sleep increases stress hormones because the brain can't rest and balance out your hormone levels. I definitely feel stressed. 
Girlfriend asked if I was ready to tell her where her laptop was. Didn't tell her. She said my job is dumb and I'm dumb and that she doesn't really need her stupid laptop anyways and went to sleep. Day 5. 10 a.m. Back in military days when we used to go with little sleep for days, there was a point you hit where you weren't really tired anymore even though your body was exhausted, like your brain tricking your body. I feel like that a lot now. Research says that your brain dumbs down when you don't sleep. I have to agree. To test myself, I tried to do a math quiz online and did horrible. I don't even feel like trying to write today. 10 p.m. Girlfriend asked for a laptop a bunch. Didn't tell her. She said no sex then. Jokes on her, research says you lose your sex drive without sleep because your hormones are out of balance and lack energy. It's a Mexican standoff, but she's got no bullets in her gun. I win. Day 6. 10 a.m. Today is Saturday, but I forgot. I only realized because girlfriend didn't go to work today. Days sometimes blur together because I don't have the regular 9 to 5 job, but definitely affected by lack of sleep. Typically go somewhere on Saturdays, but no energy to do anything. Really trying hard not to sleep. Played all of Final Fantasy 7 this week to keep busy. Great game, but guess what? 6 is better. You could suck an internet, but 7 is inferior to 6. 10 p.m. I'm pretty sure I fell asleep a few times today, but don't remember. Girlfriend insists I didn't, so either memory is completely falling apart or I slept with my eyes open. Research says that severe lack of sleep disrupts a brain's ability to form memories properly. Coupled with poor nutrition, this can cause serious memory problems and definitely have not been eating right. Too much junk food. But I guess, like research said, just the body trying to energize. Really hard to type these entries. Keep making a lot of mistakes and having to rewrite, plus sentences that don't make sense. I had to start setting alarms every 30 minutes on my phone to make sure I didn't fall asleep accidentally. Girlfriend also tried to get the location of the laptop from me, driving her nuts to not have it specifically since it's the weekend. She warned me that experiment ends in one day, but lack of sex could last much longer if I didn't tell her. Not even the CIA is as evil as she is. They should put her in charge of interrogating terrorists. Day 7, 1 p.m. I don't know when I fell asleep last night, but I woke up 10 minutes ago. Definitely overslept the three hour limit. When I woke up, girlfriend was on her laptop, and when I asked her how she found it, she just kept smiling and saying she got me. I honestly don't remember telling her, but no way she found it on her own. I'm not convinced she didn't borrow a laptop that just looks like hers, so I would do my entry and write here where I hid her real laptop after I fall back asleep. Research says that's paranoia. Lack of rest rewires the brain and makes the irrational seem rational. Screwed up with the sleep, but going to try to stay up anyway. 10 p.m. I feel like I could stay up more, but I'm not going to. All day I've been spacing out, really hard to concentrate on writing entries, but not as irrational or hard as I thought it would be at the start. Keep reading and rereading sentences and hoping they make sense though. Been seeing things the last two days, like shadows moving in the corner of my eye. Research says extreme lack of sleep leads to hallucinations, and I agree. We'll be sitting by myself and suddenly think I saw a figure moving at the edge of my vision. Knees also have been given out on me and almost fell twice today from absolute exhaustion. I think I maybe accidentally told girlfriend where the laptop was, but forgot that I did that. Research says that it can happen with prisoners. They give up info and have no memory of it, or they make up false info because their brains are scrambled. But maybe she just borrowed the laptop, still trying to make me think I gave up the location, so I'll just say or write down where the real one is. She did show me pictures on it though and her login. That's pretty convincing, but I thought what if she just downloaded the pics and set it all up? That's definitely paranoia. So I think I'm going to officially call it here. Dear Internet, a week without sleep makes you grumpy, paranoid, makes you want junk food but not normal food, kills your sex drive, makes you fall asleep with your eyes open, and annoys your girlfriend. So don't do it. Guess what, Infographics fans? That's right, it's challenge time again. Over the past year, we've been exploring the limits of human endurance, testing the strength of the human mind, body, and spirit. Today, we're back again with another special challenge episode as we seek to delve once more into the greatest scientific mysteries of our time, such as what would happen to your body if you stayed in a bath for 24 hours without a break. This greatest of scientific explorations can only be undertaken by your favorite and our slightly less disposable than before staff writer. So stay tuned to find out just how pruney the human body can get. Hour Zero I've never done well in confined spaces. I remember when I went to see Kill Bill ages ago in movie theaters, and there's that scene where Uma Thurman finds herself in a coffin. I practically had a panic attack because I really hate enclosed spaces and sitting still for too long. Now, suddenly, my entire life for one day straight is going to be both of these things. Though I guess I should be grateful, I'm just going to be living in a tub and not a coffin. I immediately regret saying that because I'm sure someone over at the infographics just got a very bright idea for the next challenge. I have to live in the bathtub 
for the next day. I've made a habit of trying to think of what insane, dangerous, or humiliating challenge the infographic show could be coming up with next, but honestly, I never thought of this at all. And believe me, I've done a lot of brainstorming as I try to prepare for what might be next. It's a pretty obvious choice for a challenge, really, but so simple I never thought about it. I remember taking really long baths as a kid and I'd play with my Legos in the tub. It was a blast. My fingers would get all super pruney and the first time it happened I cried because I thought it was permanent. Of course, it didn't help matters any that my older cousin teased me and convinced me that I had just ruined my skin for life. Man, you sure are gullible when you're a little kid. I guess today I'm going to find out just how pruney the human body can get. I know from survival school that you want to keep yourself as dry as possible when you're stuck out in the wilderness because if your skin is always wet, it can start to actually slough off and expose lower layers of skin to infection and other nasty things. I can't help but wonder if something similar could happen here. I'm not sure how long it would take for skin to actually start falling off. I tried googling it, but surprise surprise, nobody really knows. I guess today I'm making internet history by discovering exactly how long until your skin starts peeling off like the peel of an overripe fruit. Hooray, he said very sarcastically. So the rules are simple, I have to stay in the tub no matter what. I'm only allowed to get out of the water to use the toilet, because we are civilized people after all. Other than that though, I can't get out of the tub. Once more food won't really be a problem thanks to food ordering apps and entertainment is simple with the phone and the laptop. Modern life is so convenient that it's a little scary to think I could literally live my entire life in a bathtub and never leave for anything. Even most of my work is done online over the computer, and I can sign up for electronic transfer for all of my bills. It's kind of fascinating when you think about it. Okay, I'll check in every four hours or so. I don't own Legos anymore, so I'll be entertaining myself by re-watching the Lord of the Rings trilogy and completely ignoring that the Hobbit movies were ever a thing. Hour 4 Rub a dub dub, four hours in the tub. I'm not gonna lie, these first four hours have been kind of relaxing. We have a small tub, but it's kind of really relaxing. And there's soft padding on one end so you can lay back with bubble jets along the rib of the tub. It's actually a pretty sweet setup. Funny thing is, I've never in the seven or so years that we've been living in this apartment used the tub to take an actual bath. I'm just not a bath guy. And sure, a bath with your significant other is romantic, but our tub is sadly not big enough. Typically, the girlfriend takes a long bath once a week or so, and I totally get it now. I even used some of her fancy soap oils, and now my skin is silky smooth. I accidentally used too much of the bubble stuff though, and for a minute I thought I was going to die from asphyxiation as more bubbles than you've ever seen in your life filled the tub and then literally went everywhere on the floor. Have you ever put regular dishwashing liquid in a dishwasher? Yeah, it was a lot like that. For 30 minutes, it was man versus bubble in this bathroom, with me fighting for my life against an inexorably rising tide of rose-smelling bubbles. Needless to say, the girlfriend is not going to be pleased about the mess. Well, I can totally see why she does her weekly hour-long bath. Sure, four hours is a bit much, but I'm still kind of loving it. My fingers are prune city, and I got curious and did some googling, and it turns out that your fingers may actually turn pruney because it's your body's way of helping you get a grip under the water. Very neat. It's getting close to lunchtime and I'm getting a bit hungry, but with food apps getting something tasty to eat won't be a problem. So far, one of the easiest challenges I've ever done. Hour 8. Okay, so I ordered lunch on Postmates and it wasn't until I got the notification that my delivery driver was a few minutes away that the fatal flaw in my plan suddenly hit me. I can't leave the tub to answer the door. I'm home alone. The girlfriend's filming and won't be back until later today, so unless I could teach the dog how to grow an opposable thumb and turn a doorknob, I was in trouble. Now, we live in a pretty safe part of LA, and even though I insist on the girlfriend locking the door when she's home alone, I honestly never do it myself when it's just me. I grew up in a really rough neighborhood, and the place we're at now is basically Disneyland by comparison, so I never feel the need. I'm sure you guys can already see where this is going, and yes, that's exactly where it went. When my driver arrived, I got the notification. Susan has arrived with your food. Then a moment later, this Susan called me to ask which apartment it was exactly. I knew it was a bad idea. I knew what it was going to look like, but rules are rules, and I could not leave my tub. I asked Susan if she would please bring the food up the stairs and into the apartment itself, explaining that I was suffering from a medical condition and was currently unable to make it to the door itself. Susan hesitated and really, who could blame her? But bless her heart, she agreed. A minute later, I heard the door slowly creak open and Susan called out, hello, in that unsure, very wary tone of a voice that any normal person would have not knowing if they were about to enter the home of a serial killer. My dog ran up to her immediately and he absolutely loves people, plus he was pretty cute 
So I guess that set her at ease. After all, what serial killer owns a happy little dog? I called out the Susan and apologized profusely, explaining I was stuck in the tub and would she please mind setting the food just inside the bathroom door. A very long, very awkward silence followed, and then Susan asked me, you're like normal, right? You're not going to do anything weird, are you? Yes, dear Susan, I am a perfectly normal guy who just happens to have a job where he has to spend 24 hours in a bathtub, and now I'm asking you, a complete stranger, to walk into my house and bring me food as I marinate in lukewarm water completely naked, because my mouth often works faster than my brain. Before I could think about it, I blurted out, I mean, I'm mostly normal. Susan must have been an angel, or incredibly brave, because she came to the bathroom. I had created some courtesy bubbles to conceal myself, and we just sort of looked at each other for a moment. Then she placed the food down and shook her head, muttering, I really hate this job. Then Susan left. Wherever you are now, Susan, I am sorry this is the way you had to meet me, but thank you. Unfortunately, she left the food out of reach and I had to use the Swiffer I had been using to pull things toward me to slide the food close enough which resulted in the salad I had ordered to fall off the counter and spill everywhere. Because it was a salad, the dog refused to even touch it. So now there's a large Caesar salad decorating the majority of the floor to our bathroom, and some poor college-age girl working a part-time delivery job to make ends meet probably thinks I'm a sex offender. The girlfriend is really not going to be happy about any of this. Hour 12. I have officially spent half a day in the tub. The novelty has definitely worn off, and I had to drain the tub and fill it with cool water because I felt like sitting in lukewarm water this long was starting to make me dizzy. My fingers are basically ghost white at this point, and I'm more pruny and wrinkly than a Sharpay. My dog's been hesitantly coming to visit me in the tub. He typically will not enter the bathroom under any circumstances because he's terrified of getting a bath. And when it comes time to bathe him, it takes me and the girlfriend both to chase him down and then drag him into the tub. Today, though, I guess he figured it was safe to enter the bathroom and maybe from his point of view he was really sorry for me. I guess from the way he sees it, I must be in hell since I've been stuck in the tub for a half a day. He came by at one point and gave me a sympathetic lick on my hand. I'm feeling extremely restless. I really hate sitting still, which is why my previous challenge to sit on the couch and watch YouTube for 24 hours straight was so hard. Now I feel confined, and I swear I'm starting to get a little claustrophobic. I yearn to just walk around, stretch my legs. Heck, I'd even go for a run right now, and I very famously dislike running. It's a very boring exercise. Still, I'm halfway down and none of my skin has fallen off. Yet. 12 hours to go. Hour 16. So I started this challenge shortly after the girlfriend left for work and I realized I never told her. She got home and when she called out for me I told her I was in the bath. I could tell from the tone of her voice that she thought it was super cute. Like I said before, I never take baths and I'm kind of famous for it. Then she walked into the bathroom and found the bathroom floor covered in salad, which was itself floating in large puddles of water from when I overdid the bubbles and they got all over the bathroom. She didn't say a word at first, just looked around, looked at me, and face bombed. Then simply said, I need a shower, and she left to go next door to our friend's place so she could use her shower. Finally, she came back and simply asked me how many days I was going to be living in the tub, and she sounded relieved to hear that I only had a few hours left. Then she spotted the bottles of oils and bubbles that I had used and had a mini panic attack when she realized how much I had used, because apparently they are very expensive and you're only supposed to use a few squirts in your bath. I think I'd used at least a quarter of each bottle. Well, now it's night time, and while she gets to sleep in the bed, I have to figure out how I'm going to sleep in the tub. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little scared of somehow drowning, which I'm sure sounds ridiculous, until you have to spend your entire day in a tub. Hour 24. It's morning and I am free. My night sleeping in the tub was terrible, if only because I kept waking myself up due to the irrational fear that I would somehow slip under the water and drown. Yes, I know the human body doesn't work like that, but don't judge me until you've spent a whole day in the tub. My fingers and my hands look like something out of a horror show, and when the girlfriend got a clear look at them this morning, she almost screamed. She's terrified my skin is going to start falling off now, and admittedly, it feels kind of like it could. It's really, really soft, like too soft. I tested it and I pinched one wrinkle and tugged at it and a few layers of skin came loose. Nothing major, but I feel like if I wanted to I could easily start ripping off a lot of skin on my body. Or at least my hands, toes, and fingers. Oh, and yeah, that one other part too. I think if you were to sit in a tub for say, three days, you could probably kiss some of your flesh goodbye, because it would probably fall right off. Either way, it's not something I'm eager or willing to try to find out. 
I'm really sore, especially from where my body was laying against the tub for most of the time. And the skin there is really whitish red and tender. I bet if I had stayed there much longer, something similar to bed sores would have started happening. If you've never seen a bed sore, Google it right now and open up the images tab and then say goodbye to your meal plans. So yeah, spending a whole day in the tub is kind of monotonous and boring. Even with the internet and modern conveniences, I honestly wouldn't recommend it, especially if you're a fan of your skin staying put on your body. Sadly, we were never meant to be mermaids, though while I was in the tub I did read that you would wrinkle less if you added salt to your bath water. In hindsight, it's something I wish I had read before I tried this. And yes, I left Susan a very big tip. You've seen him take on the hottest pepper in the world, or at least the hottest we could conveniently get shipped in the mail. You've seen him survive three days homeless on the streets of Los Angeles. You've seen him live for 24 hours trapped in a bathtub and give a poor delivery driver trust issues. Now we're turning over our fourth from the bottom most important writer to you, the fans, and leaving him to your mercies. Today we're putting him in a survival challenge situation that comes straight from the viewers, 72 hours alone in the forest. Ok, so before I get into my experiences with this challenge, I just want to be upfront and state that this might be my last challenge episode. The infographic show pays me well for the sometimes dangerous situations I get myself into, but after this challenge I had to step back and really think about if I want to continue with these challenges. As you'll find out, I ran into some serious trouble out there, and things could have gone bad multiple times, and I think I just need to reevaluate things going forward. Unfortunately, I lost my journal during one of these incidents, so I'll have to work from memory on retelling my wilderness survival experience. When I first got the challenge, I was kind of excited. Truth be told, one of the reasons I do these challenges is because I like pushing my limits. I hate sitting at home being comfortable all the time, which might sound weird, but I guess I've accepted that it's just who I am. It definitely drives the girlfriend crazy who would prefer I live a perfectly safe, normal life. Three days and nights alone in the forest and not just the backyard woods, we're talking real forest. For this challenge I actually went up to NorCal because SoCal isn't so well known for forests. Plus we're entering fall which means that the few mountain forests that are here are going to get very very cold and possibly even snowed on, which would very quickly make this challenge extremely dangerous. For a solo challenge with no support, I'm not willing to risk it. I went up north enough to hit the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest. The show's lawyers have warned that we shouldn't give out any specific locations so that nobody's crazy enough to try to go up there and repeat our experiment. This is also a perfect opportunity to state the obvious. Don't do this. Seriously, don't. I know it sounds easy to do some silly challenge, but the fact is that wilderness survival is pretty serious business. I have training courtesy of the US military on how to survive in various wilderness environments, and years of experience putting that knowledge to the real world test in very stressful situations. You may think you're ready from watching a bunch of YouTube prepper videos, but believe me, you're not. This isn't some weird flex. It would honestly devastate me to find out a fan decided to go out there and try this for real and got themselves hurt or worse. If you're interested in survival, take some local classes or join the Boy Scouts. Get out there into the woods in a supervised environment and build the fundamentals. Matter of fact, I recommend it to everyone. You never know when some basic survival skills will come in handy. Now back to the challenge. For this challenge, I'll have only a survival knife, which by the way is not a fancy Leatherman or anything like that. It's literally a folding knife and that's about it, though it's pretty wicked sharp. It has a reinforced grip and the bottom of the grip is blunted so that you can use it to smash things, but that's about all the utility you're getting out of it. I'll also have the clothes I wear, which will be underwear, thermal underwear, hiking pants, t-shirt, sweatshirt, and poncho. Sadly, I can only take the socks I get to wear, which do not estimate the necessity of fresh socks in a survival situation. The moment your feet go bad, your odds of survival plummet dramatically. That's about it, except for 4 packets of energy gel, a map of the local area, and a compass. The energy gel is for emergencies only, and the map and compass so that I can navigate my way back to my pickup at the end of 3 days. I'm going to only briefly peruse the map so I'm oriented before heading in, but I will be scouting out the wilderness myself to find sources of water and food. No cheating by pinpointing the locations of lakes, rivers, or anything like that beforehand. I originally wanted to take a crew member with me to document things, as I thought it might be fun for you guys to see them more than just animation, but sadly hiring out professional crew is pretty expensive. 
and then there's union concerns over the nature of this challenge, as well as insurance which adds up to a pretty <laughs> whopping figure. Basically, until the infographics is a TV show, I would count this possibility out. You know what to do fans, start writing to the big TV studios. I got dropped off at 5 in the morning on my first day by friends I have from my time in the military who live in the local area. We mapped out a general area which I would try to stay inside by using some easily identifiable boundaries, such as a set of cliffs and a river. And then we picked three different rendezvous locations for pickup. This way if I got injured there would always be a pickup location nearby that I could get to no matter where within the area I wandered. Also, it would give any search and rescue parties places to start their efforts at. Planning is extremely important for wilderness survival. When you're in a survival situation, you have to immediately prioritize and then work on your needs in order of priority. My first need was to find water, as I could easily survive the three days with no food but would get into trouble really fast if I couldn't find drinkable water. I'm near the coast, but hopefully everyone watching knows that drinking seawater is an absolute no-go. One big benefit though is that early in the morning mist blows off the sea and saturates trees and bushes with water droplets. My problem was that I had no container to store water in, so I decided to take a risk and take off my poncho to turn that into a makeshift water bag. When you're in the wilderness, staying dry is very important because being wet can very quickly lead to hypothermia even if the outside temperature is not that cold. Water is really good at leaching heat from your body into the environment so it's important to stay dry as much as you can. However, being wet is also a really good way for bacterial and fungal infections to take hold and can absolutely devastate your feet. Once more, if your feet go bad, your odds of survival fall dramatically. Go image search trench foot and see why it's important to stay dry. Just make sure you do it on an empty stomach. I gathered the corners of my poncho to turn it into a makeshift bag and then I took my shirt off while putting back on my sweatshirt and I used the t-shirt to wick up moisture off tall grasses and tree leaves. Then it was as simple as wringing out the water into my poncho bag and pretty soon I had a decent amount of water stored up, enough that I felt safe looking for a more permanent solution. With water temporarily taken care of, I started looking for a place I could set up long term. If you can find a cave, that's the most ideal place to take shelter, though you have to worry about animals who are thinking the same thing and this typically means mountain lions and bears here in the US. I was too far from the mountains in the distance to risk trying to find a cave, so I decided I could pretty easily build a lean-to shelter from all the fallen tree branches and dead leaves. Location though is important, so I surveyed my environment to figure out where to build my shelter. I was very near the coast, probably only 2 or 3 miles from the beach, and the terrain sloped slowly upward to the distant mountains to my east. There was another stretch of mountains north of me which told me that I was in a very broad valley and that's very good news because if I followed parallel to the coastline the odds of finding a small stream or full blown river were really good. All that mountain snow has to run off somewhere and it would either pool into lakes between the sea and the mountain cul-de-sac I was in or it would run as streams. I hiked for a few hours as the sun started to rise and evaporate all of the mist. If you're relying on condensation from mist for water, you want to collect it very early in the morning because as soon as the sun rises it's going to start evaporating. Shortly before noon I hit a small creek winding its way through the middle of the woods, exactly as I predicted, so I decided to set up shop near it. You might be tempted to build your shelter right there next to the water, but that can be a bad idea for several reasons. First of all, heavy rain or other events further upstream could cause the water level to suddenly rise, which could wash away your shelter. Second, animals like water too, including predators. It's important to note though that even herbivores can be very dangerous and yes, deer can and have killed people before. I decided I'd build my lean-to about 20 minutes from the water and got ridiculously lucky when I found a large overturned tree that had collapsed onto another tree. With the two trees acting as a wall and a roof, I simply got to work sawing off large branches and laying them down over both trees. Then I covered the leafy branches with dead leaves and a bunch of grass, covered that in turn with a layer of dirt and once more another layer of leafy branches and grass. Thankfully there were plenty of bushes around and by the end of it, I had a pretty decent little lean-to build. Even better, I found a bunch of grubs in the dead wood and as long as you avoid the little nasty pinchers some of them have, they make for a great snack. Grubs may be gross but they're jam-packed with protein and fat. Generally, the grosser an insect looks to you, the better it is to eat. 
The only bugs you should avoid are any with a hard shell such as roaches or grasshoppers. You should eat those only if you've roasted them in a fire because of parasites. You can still get parasites from plenty of other things, but you always want to mitigate your odds of danger as much as possible. Survival is risky business, plain and simple. I decided the next thing I needed was tools and the very first thing I needed was something for self-defense. This being fall, the odds of running into a bear were lower than normal, but because most bears would be looking for a place to hibernate by now, this leaves only the bears who didn't pack on as many pounds and were desperately trying to add weight. These bears are far more dangerous than they normally would be and this fact would come into play very soon. I decided I'd use the knife to make a spear and hunt it around for a long, decently thick branch I could use. It took a bit more time, but I managed to find a nice hardwood branch with good length on it. But instead of sharpening the tip to a point, I decided that the branch was stiff enough to simply splint the top of it into a cross shape. In an emergency, I could jam the open knife into the tip deep enough to stay firmly secure, and I'd have myself a pretty efficient and deadly spear, far deadlier than a sharpened stick. It would probably only last a few jabs into a big animal, but that should be enough to drive it back. Next, I set about working on a way to contain and transport water. Notice again that I'm more worried about water than food. I really can't stress enough how important water is. This being a Pacific Northwest rainforest, I knew I couldn't rely on the poncho forever, as I'd eventually need to stay dry myself. I tried finding discarded tree bark, hoping I could fashion a few pieces of bark into a rough bowl shape. But I actually got even luckier than that, I found a white plastic bag. Normally, I hate people who litter, but in this case it ended up being exactly what I needed, though you still shouldn't litter. Water is good, but water safety is also very important. So next I worked on a way to help make the water from the creek safe to drink. I found tree bark which I could rip off, and I managed to get a large curved piece which I could bend just slightly into a very shallow bowl shape. It wouldn't hold much water and I'd be reduced to basically taking sips at a time, but it was the best I could do. I need a fire to make the water safe though, and this proved far more difficult than anything before. It actually took me until just a few hours before nightfall to get a fire going. Starting a fire with no tools has always been one of my weak areas, and it didn't help that most of the wood I could find was pretty humid thanks to how wet the Pacific Northwest tends to be. Without tools, the best way to start a fire is to gather some kindling, dry pine needles work like a charm and a piece of large soft wood. You can typically find soft wood in the large branches of living trees, or just split a very young tree in half. The wood from dead trees is hard and no good for this. But it is good for the second thing you need, a stick of very hard wood. Basically you create a channel down the middle of the soft wood and you put your kindling at the bottom of it. Then with your hardwood stick you rub it up and down the channel over and over again, repeatedly for hours, until you finally cause enough friction to actually light the kindling. Now I've seen people do this in just 15 minutes, but it took me hours to get going. Like I said, not my strong suit in the survival game. Eventually though, I had a small fire just outside my lean-to, and I gathered up some large flat rocks so that I could eventually cook on them. For now though, I had spent my entire day setting up shelter, building tools, and finding water, so there wouldn't be much food to eat. Instead, I heated up one of the large flat rocks in the middle of the fire and then pulled it out with sticks. I immediately placed my makeshift bowl on the hot rock and filled it with as much water as I could manage, which wasn't very much. Tree bark makes for terrible bowls. Boiling water was going to be out of the question without metal tools, but if you can heat water up enough, it can destroy harmful bacteria. It's an imperfect solution, but like I said before, survival comes with risks, and your job is to simply mitigate, not negate those risks. With a decent little camp set up, I returned to the creek as the sun started to set, hoping I could score some water critters for dinner. I didn't want to be away from camp when night fell, so I wouldn't accidentally get lost, so I didn't spend much time looking. Sadly, the only thing I managed to score was some edible lichens, which wouldn't do much to curve my hunger after not eating all day. That's alright though, because I had water to drink and that was far more important. Dealing with hunger is easy as long as you're hydrated. That night I planned out my strategy for day two. I had dried my clothing over the fire and dried my feet off by holding them close to the fire. Water was nearby and plentiful, and I figured with only three days out here I could risk getting sick by drinking without treating the water, because trying to sterilize sips of water at a time just wasn't going to work out long term. I knew I was only a few miles from the coast, so I planned on following the creek to the beach to find mussels and other edibles. The coast can be a bonanza of stuff to eat if you don't mind the gross taste. 
All in all, my situation was looking pretty good. I even managed to keep embers going in a small pit inside my lean-to when it started to rain outside. Then things took a turn for the weird and the very dangerous. I don't know what time of night it was, but I woke up to the sound of, I don't know, it almost sounded like human screaming, but more high-pitched. The sounds were coming from a few miles away, and I have to admit, it had me really spooked. I'm pretty familiar with the sounds of the American wilderness, and this was no screeching owl or bellowing elk or wounded animal of any kind. The sounds changed between short high-pitched screams and then long, very deep howls. Sometimes they would come from one direction, and there would be a reply from a completely different direction. I've never been around wolves in the wild, so it might have been a wolf pack for all I know, only I'm pretty sure there are no known wild wolves in the Pacific Northwest. The howls and screams came pretty intermittently, maybe once or twice every 10 minutes or so, but lasted for a long while. I wasn't going to risk sleep with an unknown animal out there so close by. Maybe it was one or two weird or wounded elk. They can actually bellow pretty loud. I've just never heard that scream in this style before. Either way, wounded animals are dangerous. It was lucky that I stayed awake because at some point, again, hard to tell the time without a watch, after the howls and screams settled down, I heard heavy breathing, grunting, and shuffling in the woods nearby. I already had my knife wedged into my makeshift spear shaft, and honestly, I felt my blood go ice cold because I was pretty sure I knew exactly what was lumbering my way. These were sounds I recognized. A black bear lumbered through the trees, just a few dozen feet away. I held perfectly still, hoping it wouldn't decide to investigate my makeshift camp. But it probably spotted my lean-to and thought the same thing I was thinking when I built it. Dry shelter in the rain. The first thing I did was carefully observe the bear. It was definitely not full grown and was a fair bit on the lean side of things. This meant two things, an inexperienced juvenile that had not done a very good job of fattening up for winter. On one hand, it could make the bear desperate for food and humans make good eating. On the other hand, it was likely weak and if it had been so outcompeted for food, then it was likely a bit of a pushover. I also tapped into what I know about predatory animals. They prefer to ambush prey or launch hunts on their terms. Predators are notoriously shy animals and can have a very low confidence when confronted. This is because if a hunt goes awry, they can suffer an injury and this could impact their ability to hunt and possibly lead to starvation. This is why you never run away from a predatory animal. It's usually better to simply back away confidently. Running triggers the hunt instinct because you confirm to the predator that you're weaker than it and scared. I decided to take a huge gamble and I ran out of my lean-to straight at the bear, shouting and yelling, thrusting with my spear. All things considered, I was basically trapped inside the lean-to and a bear could easily outrun you. It was a risk, but remember what I said about wilderness survival being risky? The bear immediately reared up on its paws, which is bad news bears, pun intended, because it might mean that it might try to fight back. Luckily for me, yelling and stabbing in the air in front of it like a wild man did the trick, and the bear lost its nerve and scampered back. I've been in close calls with wild animals, but I have never faced off a bear standing on its two hind legs. It's not something I care to ever repeat again unless I'm packing a 45 on my hip at minimum. The bear lumbered off, but I knew it wasn't safe to stay where I was. Any minute the bear could change its mind, so I packed up what few things I had and I immediately took off into the pitch black rainy woods. Normally, you never want to move at nighttime, as it's really easy to lose your bearings. If you have to, use the stars above you to pinpoint a single direction of travel and to stay in a straight line. That way, in daylight, you can retrace your steps and reorient yourself from more familiar ground. I walked for about 15 minutes and had to wait out the rainy night under a thick pine. Luckily, the rain abetted after a few hours, but I didn't get a lick of sleep that whole night. The next morning, I made my way back to my old camp and sure enough, the bear had returned and trashed the place. I made the right call. Luckily, days two and three were far less eventful. I relocated my shelter to the other side of the creek and it didn't rain for nights two and three. I changed my sleep schedule though to sleep during the day and stay up at night in case of wandering bear again. Also, I won't lie, those weird howls and screams had me on edge, especially after my encounter with the bear. On the coast, I managed to find edible mussels pretty easily and I ate some raw, which I immediately regretted and then I roasted the rest in their own shells. Mussels are great for energy, but you have to be careful if you're low on water because they can add a lot of salt water to your system. If you aren't peeing regularly, the salt in your body can add up dangerously. By the way, they taste like mermaid boogers when you eat them raw. 
I also managed to find some edible flowering plants. With flowering plants, you want to pluck the actual flower off because the sap in the stem can be really bitter and unpleasant. The bud of the flower and the petals, though, make for good eating at a pinch. And dandelions typically grow in most places. If you really don't mind the bitterness, you can eat the roots of most flowering plants, which are chock full of minerals and nutrients. Though be careful, never eat a flowering plant whose flower is umbrella shaped. Those are poisonous and may not kill you but will have your stomach twisted up in knots. Lichens and bugs made up most of the rest of my meals. Grubs were pretty plentiful in rotting logs. I couldn't remember which mushrooms are edible and which aren't so I stayed away from them, better not risk it. Also, mushrooms don't actually pack a lot of energy so don't waste time trying to look for them unless you have no other options. Same goes for trying to hunt. Wilderness survival is a numbers game, and your job is to waste as few calories as possible while gaining the most possible from what you eat. Hunting can burn a lot of calories, so forget trying to catch anything larger than a squirrel or a rabbit. And even then, only go after them if you can make some rough traps and snares, or happen to find a burrow or warden. I made it through my three days pretty alright, but very much on the hungry side. My encounter with the bear, though, definitely left me a bit shaken. That was a very serious situation which could have gone very badly. The girlfriend wasn't happy to hear about it, and we both talked for a long time about those challenges. They have definitely started to ramp up in risk, and I guess I have to think about if I really want to keep on taking some of the risks I do. I love reading some of the feedback from you guys, and I'm happy that they're entertaining and sometimes even enlightening. But I guess this whole bear experience is just making me reconsider. I'm not saying that I'm never going to do a challenge again, but I feel I just have to give it some thought. At the very least, I need a race. Hello, Infographics fans. It's time for another awesome challenge, all in the name of science. We're concerned with your hygiene because we hate to break it to you, but despite all the go natural fads out there, you should definitely be taking time to give yourself a good scrub once in a while. As usual though, we want to find out what happens to your body and mind over the long term. So once more, we're tasking our favorite, or least important anyway, staff writer with another awesome challenge. All in the name of finding out what happens if you stop showering for a month. For science! Day 1 Ok, I have a confession. I didn't tell the girlfriend about this challenge because I'm 100% sure that would not go down well at all. Hygiene is kind of important in a relationship, especially when you share a bed and are as physically active as we are. But also, there's the fact that she's been less than happy with previous challenges. That would be putting it mildly. Also, though, there's the fact that she's leaving for a film shoot in four days, and she's going to be on location for the next three weeks, so she's going to pretty much miss the entire challenge. This literally couldn't have played out any better. I think she's been getting suspicious though. Typically, I get a few weeks between these challenge assignments to rest and recoup, and also because if I didn't, I'm pretty sure my girlfriend would single handedly destroy everyone in the infographics staff. She's a trained stunt woman and can box. She's kind of scary. Anyway, she knows that right around now is when I should be getting a new challenge assigned, and I think she's suspicious that I haven't brought anything up yet. Maybe I'll just tell her there's a production delay or something. By the way, if you're wondering, we obviously don't do these challenges all back to back in real time. By the time you get to watch these episodes, the challenges were already completed a while ago to give us, or me I guess, time to do more. So I'm just not going to say anything until she gets back, which will be about the time the challenge is over. As usual, I did my research and it turns out not showering can lead to everything from acne to infections. But turns out that showering all the time is actually pretty bad for you as well. That's because your body naturally produces a layer of protection on your skin against outside infection, and all your vigorous scrubbing destroys this layer and leaves you prone to getting sick or infections. That's why some health shops sell probiotic sprays to help you grow your healthy body bacteria while making you smell nice, which by the way is complete nonsense and does not work. So stick to real science, not pseudoscience. It'll be cheaper in the long run. Just limit how long you shower each day and instead of scrubbing your entire body with soap every time, just do your stinkiest areas, groin, armpits, and butt, and rinse off the rest with water. Your body will thank you. Of course, I won't be allowed to do even that much, and I'm not looking forward to this. See, I've already done the no shower challenge in my life during my time in the military, and it was absolutely not pretty. Luckily, everybody was in on it as well, so everyone stank equally. In fact, we pretty much just smelled like gunpowder, dirt, and sweat. Though we did sometimes have the opportunity to take what we called baby wipe showers, where we used a case of baby wipes to wipe down our vital areas. 
By the way, if you know anyone deployed overseas to a forward location with no facilities, forget about sending cookies or books or anything like that. Just send baby wipes. Your very smelly and grateful military will thank you for it. So I worked a baby shower clause into this challenge, and every three days I'll be allowed to wipe groin, butt, and armpits with baby wipes because, I mean, you gotta have some hygiene in life. For the rest of me though, not a drop of water will touch my skin, and since it hardly ever rains in Los Angeles, that's a guarantee you can count on. See you in seven days, YouTube. Day 7. The girlfriend was definitely suspicious. Is suspicious, I should say. She left without asking what if any challenge there was now, but she did say that I was smelling a bit ripe when she kissed me goodbye at the airport. She's been texting me, asking what the challenge is, and I didn't want to lie to her, so I just told her that she didn't want to know. Thankfully, she's filming 12 plus hours a day, so she's typically too exhausted to push the issue. It won't surprise anyone for me to say this, but I smell. It's interesting though, because at first you really do smell quite bad, but then suddenly it's like your body achieves some sort of smell equilibrium, a smellibrium. Or maybe I've just gotten used to the smell myself. I've decided that this month the only days I'll exercise are the days I'm allowed to take a baby wipe shower, and I realize that's kind of cheating, but hey, I still do have to leave the house and run errands or meet with people, you know? Of course deodorant and cologne go a long way in those cases, and I've definitely been doing more handshakes than hugs lately. Not much else to report, to be honest. Day 14. My girlfriend's best friend came by the house today, quite unexpectedly. She said that she was here to borrow something from her but was really vague with the details and just said that she'd been told it was in the hallway closet. I was immediately suspicious because A, my girlfriend is an evil mastermind and it doesn't matter how busy or far away she is, if something is up, she has to know what. And B, my girlfriend really is an evil mastermind, I'm not joking. I saw through the transparent ploy and it didn't help that the friend kept looking around the house as if expecting to find some freak show that was part of some sadistic internet challenge. I I'm also lucky that today was a baby wipe shower day, so my secret is safe. I sent the girlfriend a text telling her to stop spying on me, and she just sent back an, I quote, suspicious face emoji. I catch whiffs of myself sometimes when the wind turns outside and I smell. I mean, definitely not good, but not awful. I am incredibly itchy though, especially in the groin. That's no surprise, given that sweat tends to accumulate there a great deal, followed by infection if you're not careful. I wonder if my baby wipe showers are going to be enough to keep things under control down there. I gotta tell you, I'm feeling pretty gross and really limiting the amount of time I spend out of the house. Luckily Skype is a thing and I can reschedule almost all of my meetings to Skype calls. Thank you technology. Day 21. Another of girlfriend's friends came by the apartment two days ago. I didn't let her in. I just peered out of the front blinds like some very smelly criminal as she knocked on the door until she quit and walked away. Even hundreds of miles away the girlfriend is persistent, but not nearly sneaky enough. Ok, this is bad. I definitely got a rash in my groin area spreading down my thighs and I'm starting to seriously question continuing with this challenge. I know it's not a big deal, just really itchy, but it's definitely extremely gross. I can't believe that people actually live like this, by choice I mean. I miss you my dear wonderful shower. I was a fool for years, never appreciating what had been available to me at the twist of a knob. Loss was my cruel teacher, and every day since I've been instructed on how good I had it, how good you were to me, and how little I appreciated it. Please forgive me shower, I promise to appreciate and adore you, and to rinse your soap scum every day. I think I smell too bad even for the dog because he's definitely not been cuddling up to me the way he typically does at night. That's a pretty damning turn of events coming from an animal who literally can't stop himself from smelling dog butts the first chance he gets. Of course, he doesn't smell like a rose either because he's an absolute maniac around water and will utterly destroy the bathroom unless you physically put him in the shower with you, close the doors, and bathe him that way. So it turns out this one month no shower challenge was for both of us, but unlike me, I know for a in fact, he likes to smell stinky given many, many times I've had to chase him away from rolling around in god knows what at the park. This rash thing though definitely is going to have to be addressed, and luckily I know exactly what to do. See, my time in the military didn't just teach me about not showering, but what to do in these situations, and the answer is rubbing alcohol. It burns like all the seven hells, but wiping down with rubbing alcohol destroys the surface layer infection which causes the rash. So tonight, I'm going to set my groin on fire and kill this before it gets any worse. I really, really hope you appreciate what I do for you, YouTube. 
Day 30. The girlfriend came home two days ago and I finally had to tell her, though to be honest, I think she probably knew the moment she took her first whiff of me. I've been banned from sleeping in the bedroom and she made me clean all the bed linens before she'd sleep in our bed. I also had to Febreze it down completely. Then she took the Febreze from me and sprayed me with it liberally and told me I wasn't allowed to cuddle her until, and I quote, this stupid challenge is over and you go back to normal and by the way, you're so lucky I wasn't here for any of this nonsense or you'd be living in a hotel. She didn't call my job stupid though the way she typically does and that's how I know she missed me. She's secretly a huge softie, a terrifying, scheming, evil mastermind of a softie. So the rash I had a week ago disappeared thanks to the rubbing alcohol treatment, which I'm pretty sure doesn't count as a shower. But let me tell you, it feels very much like showering your groin with a flamethrower. I did notice red blotches popping up under my armpits, which I suspect is another future rash in the making, but thankfully today I got to shower, so I fully expect those will be going away soon. All in all, I definitely don't recommend not showering for a full month. It's going to make you smell terrible and kind of affect your mood too, although I think that that was just a side effect of me avoiding leaving the house as much as I could. When I was a kid, my mom used to tell me that I had enough dirt behind my ears to grow potatoes and, well mom, this time you might actually be right. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go enjoy the longest shower of my life and scrub from head to toe so I can reclaim my right to sleep in my own bed. A man's home is his kingdom after all, though in my case it's obvious that I'm just renting it from my girlfriend. Hey you! That's right, you sitting there behind your computer or phone screen. Get up off your lazy keister. Get up on those feet, you bum, because today we're going to be finding out what happens when you don't get to sit for a whole week. The infographics office is as fond of reading about medical studies as you are, and when it comes to sitting or standing, it seems scientists can't decide on which will kill you first. So for the sake of our viewers, we decided to put our world-famous science team on the case to figure out just how bad standing can be. And no, it's not just because some of our staff saw a documentary on flamingos and thought to themselves, hey, what would it be like to just stand all day? We're doing real science here, folks. And to crack this nut, we're once more putting your favorite lab rat and our writer with the best medical insurance on the entire staff on the job. Day 1. No sitting for a week. I read the words over and over again in my inbox, trying to make them sink in. Is this even humanly possible? I guess yeah. it's my job to find out. Alright, so I immediately thought about how in the world to accomplish this. I went online to find out if there was a world record for standing. I found a site full of records set by average Joes. Things like, and no I'm not making this up, longest time balancing a table tennis ball on a nose while standing. Longest time to stand straight on someone's shoulders, and my personal favorite, largest group to sing happy birthday while standing on one foot. Apparently you can just submit your own video proof to set a new record, and this record can be for literally anything someone else hasn't done before. By the way, this site appears to be quite popular with Indian people, who submitted like half the records. Way to go India, you guys are the world record holders for setting world records I guess. I found another site where world records for standing still were recorded, and incredibly an Indian man, no surprise there, once stood perfectly still for an astonishing 35 hours and 22 minutes, stopping only due to an insect bite. It must have been one heck of an insect bite. I couldn't find any records for people actually standing though, just the standing still ones. I definitely don't plan on standing still. I've had my fill of lying under camouflage and trying to be as perfectly still as possible with bugs and reptiles crawling on you. I'll be living my normal life, just no sitting allowed. How I'm actually going to do this is another thing entirely. The rules are that I have to remain standing at all times, which includes sleep. And no, I can't cheat going from standing to laying down. I have to stay with my feet physically touching the ground the whole time. This is going to be insane, but I figured that the best thing to do will be to keep busy. Day 2 Alright, yesterday was the most exhausting day of my life, and honestly I'm not sure if I can physically accomplish this entire challenge. My day started out normal enough, I guess. I got up out of bed and kissed sitting down goodbye for 7 days, then hopped in the shower. The girlfriend and I have this game now where I don't tell her what my new challenges are unless they're taking me out of the house, like to live in the woods or something, and instead she has to guess what it is based on my behavior. She's smart as a whip, that one, and the moment that I started eating my breakfast standing up, she guessed that I wasn't allowed to sit. She laughed and then asked me for how long, and her eyes kind of went wide. She said that she doesn't think that 7 days is humanly possible, and I kind of agreed with her. Then she asked how I would feel because of my physical issues due to service-related injuries, and I kind of shrugged it off. Thing is, she's right. 
Due to some pretty severe bone fractures and general wear and tear on the body, I don't have the stamina I used to and my back and legs are prone to pretty bad aches and pains. I almost got a medical discharge after fracturing lower back and hip, but after a few weeks of recuperation I showed up at training wearing full kit and determined to prove that I didn't need to be discharged. It practically killed me, but I managed to convince superiors not to push a medical discharge. Maybe now it's clear why I'm so determined with these challenges and why I take them so seriously. I do not make a habit of quitting. So today I found out how hardwired we are to sit. I went throughout my day and kept having to remind myself not to sit whenever I saw a chair nearby. It was just sort of a reflex. And even when I went over to Panda Express nearby for lunch, I had to remind myself not to sit at a booth. I guess we really don't realize just how much sitting we do. Of course, I had to walk to that Panda Express because driving a car would mean sitting. I'm thinking though that I might buy one of those hoverboards and just bill it to infographics. Walking around all day is kind of exhausting. First day was rough, I'm not gonna lie. I'm in good shape, but standing all day is rough, especially when your back and hip is completely shot. Sleeping was interesting. I took inspiration from a documentary I saw on the International Space Station though. On the ISS, astronauts actually crawl inside a sleeping bag and sort of zip themselves up so they don't just float around in zero gravity. I don't know, I think if I was an astronaut, I'd love to sleep while floating. It must feel amazing, though I guess bumping into walls would be an issue. Anyways, I took a sleeping bag and cut two slots in the back, and I ran 550 cord, some of you might know it as parachute cord, through the two slots and then wrapped it from the top of the door to the bottom of the door. Then what I was left with was a sleeping bag securely fastened to the back of our bedroom door. Sleeping was as easy as sliding in and zipping it up. The 550 cord wrapped several times from the bottom of the door to the top of the door was more than secure enough to keep me up. The girlfriend had a difficult time adjusting to my sleeping arrangement though. She said that I looked like a man insect in a giant cocoon and that in the dark it kind of really freaked her out to see me just hanging there. Also she was worried that the cord would snap or something and I'd break my neck in the middle of the night, but I reassured her that 550 cord got its name from the minimum requirement of being able to hold at least 550 pounds. It was originally used in parachutes after all. I'm not gonna lie, sleeping standing up is probably a lot easier for horses and astronauts in zero G. It was not pleasant at all, but luckily I was so tired from standing all day that I did manage to fall asleep. Lurching forward the entire time was incredibly uncomfortable though and left me with a huge crick in my neck, so I managed to flip around inside my sleeping bag and end up in a slightly reclined position instead. That made sleeping easier, but in all seriousness, this is probably my top three worst sleeps of all time. It's a new day though, and I'm not looking forward to it. Day 3 Last night's sleep was likely worse than the first night. I managed to give the cord keeping my sleeping bag propped up a bit of slack, so I'm reclining more while staying up on my feet. But honestly, this is just the worst challenge ever. To add insult to injury, the girlfriend got up in the middle of the night for some water and in her groggy, half-asleep state. She forgot I was tied to the back of the door. So when she came back in and the door barely budged open because of all my weight, she basically she-hulked the door backwards and smacked me against the wall face first. Yeah, honestly, I'm hating this challenge. My second day of no sitting was worse than the first. I tried to keep myself busy, but my back is seriously starting to hurt and so doing any work was out of the question. The one person who's ecstatic about this challenge is the dog who got taken for like 12 walks today just so I could keep myself away from the temptation of sitting. The girlfriend and I had our date night yesterday, and I'm always determined to not let my challenges ruin it. I had to think about what in the world we could do with me not even being allowed to sit inside a car, and I got a brilliant idea. I dug up our old rollerblades that we haven't used in years and told her to throw them off. Then we rollerbladed down to the beach taking our dog with us on the leash. We spent the entire evening going through an art crawl and then the food trucks on the beach and then played our favorite game. We separate and one of us walks, or in this case rollerblades, far away from the other, then approaches and pretends we've never met. The object of the game is to try to pick up each other with the most ridiculous or outrageous pickup lines we can think of. We play this game everywhere and typically this means there's an audience for our ridiculous pickup lines. One time we were at a very fancy lounge and while I'd been away, a guy had tried buying her a drink only to have me come back, look her up and down and say, hey was your dad a boxer because you're a knockout. Then she started laughing so hard she almost shot her appletini out of her nose, grabbed me by the collar of my shirt and kissed me, all while the poor guy looked completely baffled. 
By the way, tonight's winning line, it came from her rollerblading up and asking, are you Israeli cause you is really hot. I gotta admit, she's not as creative as I am at this game, but that one was damn good. Despite this ridiculous challenge, I still managed to make date night fun, and I'm kinda glad I wasn't allowed to sit in a car and drive us somewhere. It's been a while since we just went out without a particular destination in mind, and I really like the fact that we didn't have to be doing anything special for it to feel special. This morning I woke up with some pretty severe aches and pains. A lot of it I think is my body and old injuries, but a significant part of it is the act of just standing all the time. Sleep is damn near impossible, and I think if I hadn't had almost a decade's experience sleeping in the most uncomfortable places in the world, I wouldn't be able to manage more than an hour or two. If the military teaches you one thing, it's how to sleep anywhere at the drop of a hat. I'm not looking forward to a third day of this mess though. Day 4 All right. I had to throw in the towel on this challenge. I believe that this is officially the first challenge I've quit on my own. I failed one other challenge before, but it wasn't my fault. True challenge fans will know exactly which one that is, by the way. I managed to power through my day, but it wasn't easy at all. The girlfriend could tell how much of a toll this standing up was taking on me, and she very sweetly tried to rub my shoulders and lower back throughout the day as much as she could. She told me that she can already feel knots forming on my back, and it's not surprising. Normally I had to follow a pretty strict yoga and stretching regime to keep my busted back and legs from aching and hurting, and obviously I'm not able to do that when I can't lay or sit. Honestly, I can deal with the terrible quality sleep and my very weird man-insect cocoon I jerry-rigged. It's the creaking aches and pains that make this unbearable. Maybe if I tried this when I was younger, before damn near a decade of lugging around almost 100 pounds on my back. I had an interpreter once tell me that Taliban fighters call American soldiers donkeys because of the ridiculous amount of gear we carry everywhere we go. I'll also admit that rollerblading for a few hours the day before was not as great an idea as I thought. That exhausted my legs, and while we had a blast on our impromptu date night, it severely drained my stamina for this stupid challenge. Also, so, do you have any idea how hard it is to put on and take off rollerblades when you can't sit? I had to hang on to the girlfriend the entire time so I wouldn't fall flat on my face. I'm not a fan of quitting anything, no matter how psychologically or physically hard, but sometime late last night my legs literally just quit on me. I got a horrible cramp in my left leg and my knee just buckled, sending me to the bottom of my sleeping bag cocoon. I got up, determined to keep going anyways after the cramp subsided, but the girlfriend had woken up and was really concerned. She told me no, she was pulling the plug on this, and then demanded I get into bed with her. I really did want to keep going. I probably take these dumb challenges too seriously, just like she always says, but it's important to me not to quit. She insisted though in the very stern way that she only ever does like once, maybe twice a year, with something she is not willing to compromise on. These things are almost always related to my health, safety, or well-being, because I guess I do have a habit of putting all three of those things in jeopardy. The only other time she's done it this year was a few months ago when I wanted to buy a full-size xenomorph from the movie Alien, and well, in hindsight, I guess she was right. I mean, it was awesomely life-size too, and it stood over 7 feet tall, but I guess waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and running into that thing would likely lead to a heart attack. So I've failed my challenge, and the girlfriends booked me a pretty intense massage therapy session with our local Thai massage place. I go from time to time for a deep tissue massage, and let me tell you, those little Thai ladies are absolutely brutal. If the CIA wants enhanced interrogation techniques, forget waterboarding. Just have these feisty little ladies go at the bodies of terrorists with their elbows, feet, and knees. It works though, and you may have to leave in a world of pain, but the next day, all all the knots in your muscles are gone. What did I learn from my three days of standing up all day? Honestly, not much. Other than the fact that it sucks exactly as much as it sounds it would. Maybe if I was younger and fresher I could have gone the distance, but also it's surprising how hardwired we are to want to sit when we see a chair or a sofa. It's practically an instinct. If you fit, you sits. Also, eating your food while standing is just weird, though it beats the time I couldn't leave bed and had to eat everything lying down. At least you don't feel like you're choking to death with every bite. 0 out of 10. Would not repeat. Worst challenge ever. In the 2008 Jim Carrey movie Yes Man, Jim plays a man whose life is at a dead end, and so he enrolls in a personal development course with a single premise, say yes to things. Inevitably, he takes it well out of context and simply decides to say yes to every single opportunity and question that comes his way, leading him to a personal transformation, a surprise romance, and a fulfilling life. We here at the Infographic Show got really bored. I mean, we did some diligent research and wanted to find out just how transforming the power of yes really was. So once more, we let your favorite lab rat out of his cage and tasked him with one job. Say yes to everything for an entire week. 
Day 1 So I'm guessing that somebody over at Infographics got nostalgic <laughs> for the 2000s and watched Yes Man, then decided, hey, that'd be cool to force somebody to do in the real world, and here I am. I watched the movie before this challenge started, and here's the thing. The movie is based on a script where the writers can shape the story to make the consequences of Jim Carrey's saying yes to everything be whatever they want it to be. Jim Carrey ends up with a brand new life and a wonderful relationship with the beautiful Zoe Deschanel. In the real world, me saying yes to everything could very well end up with me becoming a drug mule for the Mexican Mafia. More so than any challenge, this one feels it has the real potential to get me into serious trouble, and stupid me, of course, is going to do it. Rules are simple. Say yes to every opportunity opportunity and every offer that comes my way. Live my life like a positive life-affirming Zen master for a whole week and say yes to the universe. This is my week to live, laugh, love like a mid-twenties college grad going through her first of multiple existential crises. By the way, I just realized that with this challenge I'll officially have lived out the plot of two Jim Carrey movies. Can you guess which one is the other? Day 3 first 72 hours down, and what a mess things have been. I didn't tell the girlfriend about the challenge because there is no one who could handle the responsibility of me being able to say only yes worse than her. I don't even want to think what kind of terrible ridiculous thing she wrote me into doing if she knew I could only say yes to her every wish and desire. For example, she's been wanting to do this murder mystery dinner party thing with another couple, and these two are the absolute worst. They're both overdramatic to the extreme and have to be in charge of everything all the time. Honestly, I have no idea why she's friends with them, but an evening with them is like pulling your teeth out with a pair of pliers. Oh, and they love to engage in extreme PDA at the drop of a hat. No thank you. I told her that I don't mind doing murder mystery dinner parties, but absolutely not with them, and have been refusing an invitation just about every other week. Not happening. So my first day was relatively uneventful, at least until the girlfriend got home. They just built a brand new veggie grill down the street from us, and for those of you who don't know, it's a vegetarian restaurant where they only serve vegetables. She's been eyeballing it ever since they started construction, and every time she brought it up, I managed to sidestep the conversation, but this time she asked again and I dutifully said, Yes. I swear, I physically winced as the words left my mouth and she just kind of sat there for a moment and said, wow, really? Just like that? And I silently nodded while screaming inside. And off to Veggie Grill we went. Honestly, it's not that bad. Their fake chicken nuggets even kind of tasted alright. But it's always just so heartbreakingly disappointing to not be eating the real thing. And it never fills me up. Okay, so day two was a little weird. This time we went to the grocery store together and she suggested we pick up several things that made me cringe hard. Things with labels like all organic and probiotic. This apricot spinach and cardboard juice would be really healthy for you. You should pick that up instead of some soda, she said, and yes dear, I dutifully replied. Why don't you try this quinoa-based cocoa-free sugar-free chocolate made out of recycled organic fish bones and sadness instead of that Kit Kat bar? Yeah, sure. We should get some of this healthy ice cream instead of that Oreo cookies and cream. It's made out of kale, goat milk, Himalayan sea salt, and depression. Yeah, sounds great. And on and on it went, and now my kitchen is full of food that for all intents and purposes is pretty much inedible. Don't get me wrong, I know junk food is, well, junk, but there's always existed a balance between her and I. She gets to health Nazi half of our diet and I get to stay sane by occasionally indulging in the other half of the time. Now that balance is destroyed and I'm going to enjoy exactly zero of my meals for the next week. Thanks, Infographics. That, however, wasn't the weirdness of the day. The weirdness would come at checkout time. I always take a reusable bag or two with me when we go shopping. It's environmentally friendly and in California, they also charge for plastic bags in an attempt to deter you from using them and throwing them away so they end up in the ocean and murder sea turtles. So I had the two reusable bags with me and I very clearly was ready to put the groceries inside of them when the checkout girl asked me, would you like plastic bags for these? I immediately said, yes, because you know, I'm an idiot who chose this as a career and then very stupidly had to take my plastic bag groceries while holding my reusable bags in my hand. The girlfriend wasn't paying attention when it happened, but when she turned around she gave me a very stern WTF look and I just shrugged my shoulders and said maybe we can use them for trash bags. Then we walked out of the store, and if she didn't suspect something was up before, she definitely did now. Predictably, as soon as we walked out of the store we got stopped by a guy with a clipboard. 
you know the type. I typically outmaneuver these petitioners like an NFL running back on his way to scoring a game-winning touchdown, but this guy was inhuman. He practically teleported in front of us and there was no avoiding him. He wanted us to sign to show our support against the federal government forcing California to lower its gas mileage standards for vehicles. Dutifully, I said yes. The girlfriend's eyes narrowed at this point. She knows I'd go out of my way to not show public support for any specific causes, preferring to keep my support private. I don't like groups and I don't like lining myself up ideologically in public with any specific groups. It's too easy to get caught up in values that aren't your own or to have the group show values that you disagree with. But now, suddenly, everyone thinks you identify with. You just can't control a group or how they'll make you look. No thank you. Something was up, she no doubt thought to herself. Then though, the petitioner dropped a bomb. And I honestly think I hate this man now with all the fury of a thousand sons. Would you like to join us in a protest downtown in a few days? Why yes, I'd love to absolutely 100% do exactly that, I growled through my clenched teeth. Unaware of how close to death this man had just come, or the fiery furnace of wrath burning inside me at the moment, he excitedly took my phone number down so their coordinator could call me with details later in the week and voila, just like that, I'd now be protesting in public on one of my days off as part of a group. Fan freaking tastic. When we got in the car, the girlfriend grinned from ear to ear. You can't say no, she said. A very disturbingly <laughs> conniving smile spread across her face. I explained that it would be more accurate to say that I had to say yes to everything for another five days. And I swear I saw the devil in her eyes as she no doubt hatched a thousand schemes and plots, practically giddy with excitement over what she could get me to do now. Day 7 Okay, challenge over. Never repeating again. And yes man, Jim Carrey had his life turned around and got the girl all by saying yes to life and in my real life I've been blackmailed into every possible concession the girlfriend could get out of me and was once more very publicly humiliated. Let me start at the beginning. It didn't take long for the girlfriend to start abusing her power to make me say yes to everything. Back rub? Yes. Foot rub? Yes. Fetch a glass of ice water? Yes. I'm tired, can you take the dog out again? Yes. Predictably, I basically became a slave. Although to her credit, she only abused it in this fashion for the first day and I suppose I can't blame her too much for it. I mean, imagine you could get someone to do your every whim for a whole week. If anything, I'm impressed by her restraint. However, she inevitably remembered that she could now get me to go to every social engagement I have fought her tooth and nail on since forever. So guess who got to go to a baby shower and then a birthday party for the 8-year-old son of one of her friends this week. I don't really do children. It's only been recently that I've warmed up to the idea of having one of our own one day. And to be honest, deep down inside, I love the thought of having a child with her. But other people's kids? Oh god no. Anything but that. I'm weird and awkward around children. I once had to text three different friends asking them how you introduce yourself to a 10 year old. Do you just like give them a handshake or something? So I got to sit through a birthday party full of screaming children whom I had no idea how to properly interact with. Like I know nothing about children. Do they even know how to tell faces apart at 8 years old? Then there was the baby shower where I had to sit quietly with the two other husbands slash boyfriends who got roped into going while the women all oohed and aahed at various baby related gifts. I didn't even know what gift we should bring. I suggested a blender because not entirely sure how baby food works and the girlfriend just shook her head and dragged me shopping for baby Bjorns. The real prize of the week though, and I knew, just knew that this would happen, which is why I didn't tell the girlfriend about this challenge in the first place and I bet most of you can guess. Yep, murder mystery dinner with Mr. and Mrs. Overly dramatic super bossy very publicly inappropriate PDA. Oh, and it was period themed so of course we had to wear costumes and act the part which Mr. and Mrs. Overly Dramatic absolutely loved. So the way it worked was like this, we showed up, randomly pulled rolls out of a hat and then got dressed in our period appropriate costumes. I got the role of an army officer which was kind of on the nose to be honest, but the girlfriend got the role of mistress and I could not stop laughing when she read it aloud. I proceeded to call her wench for the evening and my arms are bruised badly from all the time she punched me for calling her wench. As some of you know she boxes regularly so she's got a nasty jab. Mr. and Mrs. Overly Dramatic though, well, he pulled police chief and she got aspiring starlet. Already I could tell the evening was going to be the single most painful unbearable experience in human history. So 
You're supposed to sit for dinner while they serve you different courses, and right from the get-go Mr. and Mrs. Drama would steadfastly refuse to acknowledge you unless you address them by their fictional character names. Oh, and they demanded that we go around the table and make up backstories for our character and introduce ourselves, except they would insist on making helpful and very forceful suggestions to every single person's backstory. You know, little notes to enhance the immersion. I honestly think I shattered a molar from grinding my teeth. It was barely 10 minutes into the evening and already they were trying to control everybody's experience. There's an unwritten rule about these old-timey murder mystery dinner events where everyone for some reason puts on a British accent. The moment you think murder mystery, everyone thinks British, it's really weird. So naturally, I put on the most awful Australian accent I could manage, explained that I was an officer from down under, and called everyone mate except the girlfriend, whom I referred to exclusively as wench, receiving a swift punch in the arm in return every time. To make a very painful and long story short, halfway through the first course, the lights go out and everything is pitch black. There's a fake gunshot and someone screams and when the lights come back up, the lord of the manor is dead from a gunshot wound. Then you're supposed to figure out who did it because secretly when you drew for characters your slip says if you were the murderer or not, and you get a prop gun to hide. I'm sure with any other group of people they could have been a blast, but right from the start Mr. and Mrs. Drama took charge and of course they did, he did pull a chief of police after all, and we spent about an hour with those two going back and forth grilling people's backstories and randomly making out with each other for no reason in front of us, all while I tried to just eat my food after struggling to make it to dessert. Seriously, they serve you so damn slowly at these things. I finally announced that since the Lord of the Manor had previously been an officer in the Navy and I was the only officer from Her Majesty's Royal Navy, I was officially declaring the investigation a matter of national security and then blamed the wench who punched me for calling her that and charged her with murder. She protested as did the rest of the room and I told them that this was the 19th century Britain apparently and as a military officer I could literally blame anyone who wasn't noble with no evidence and nobody would dare question me. I then said I needed to take the wench, punched me again, for a very private and intense search to find the murder weapon on her person, no matter where it may be hidden, to which she punched me again, this time for being gross. Turns out though, she really was the killer. Of course, it took half an hour of back and forth with Mr. and Mrs. Drama Boss dictating the whole thing, when they should have just let me strip search my wench girlfriend in the first place. If that wasn't enough, the next day I had to show up at the protest I had promised to attend. And guess what, the organizers had only gotten like half a dozen people to show up, so I got to march around downtown Los Angeles holding a sign up with five other people chanting random slogans. In life, and especially in a relationship, it's important to compromise and say yes sometimes to things you don't want to do. It makes other people happy when you agree to things that they want to do or they like to do even if you don't like or want to do those things. Compromise is basically the secret to a happy friendship or a happy relationship. This week though, I did enough compromising to last me the next several years and if anyone comes up to me while I'm exiting the store with a petition in hand, I'm karate chopping them in the face and running away before they can recover. The Carolina Reaper is the world's hottest pepper, clocking in at an astonishing 1.5 million Scoville heat units, which is a rating used to determine how spicy a food item is, while a regular jalapeno clocks in at a mere 100,000 to 350,000 SHUs, the pepper is purely man-made, as nature is incapable or evil enough to produce a pepper so fiery hot, and is the brainchild of a former pot grower who began to use his knowledge of botany to crossbreed peppers. Competitions around the world challenge people to try to eat three of these miniature peppers with an atomic punch to see who can down the fastest and keep them down. But what is it like to actually eat one of these red hot monsters? To find out, we tasked one of our writers with sitting down and eating one Carolina Reaper and recording his observations. T minus one minute. Sitting in front of me are two Carolina Reapers, the world's hottest peppers. Allegedly, each one of these tiny peppers has a Scoville heat rating of one and a half million. But the website these came from claims that some peppers can get as hot as 2 million. That's fantastic and that's sarcasm. I don't even like spicy food, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm seriously rethinking my current employment status. These peppers actually smell kind of pleasant, almost fruity. From what I've read online, and I've done a lot of research, they have a slightly fruity taste as well. I guess that's right before the lava kicks off. The plan is simple. I eat the first pepper and write down what it feels like, tastes like, etc. I've done a lot of research on how peppers affect the body, so after my initial observations I'll come back and add what was biological 
magically happening to me. If anything goes wrong or I feel I didn't get enough from the first pepper, I'll try the second one. Here it goes. T minus zero seconds. They're right about the slightly fruity taste. I don't know if chewing fast or slow is best. To be fair to the experience, I'm trying to chew the pepper thoroughly. Definitely starting to burn though. Post commentary. Chilies and peppers evolved capsaicin as a defense against unwanted foraging by animals, such as mice and insects, which would destroy the plant's seeds. The capsaicin is thus released mostly from the membrane of the fruit as an animal's teeth tear it to pieces. T plus 10 seconds. Yep, it burns. It burns really bad. Post commentary. The capsaicin binds to the TRPV1 receptors inside your mouth, which are designed to detect heat and are activated by temperatures over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. The latched on capsaicin, however, causes the receptors to be confused, triggering their pain warnings with temperatures as low as 93 degrees Fahrenheit, which is below the average human body temperature. That means your own body heat triggers the burning response, which is what makes spicy food so unbearable. You literally can't get away from the burn. T plus 20 seconds. I tried to speak and I couldn't. Swallowed the mashed up pepper and my throat is on fire. Stomach starting to burn too. Post commentary. When you swallow a mashed up pepper, the capsaicin triggers TRPV1 pain receptors along the esophagus and the stomach. This might seem an odd place for these pain receptors, but it makes perfect sense if you've ever hastily swallowed something far too hot for your own good. The pain response is meant to protect you and teach you to be patient and wait for your hot cocoa to cool down. Or to not eat the world's hottest pepper ever again. T plus 30 seconds. Sweating profusely. Girlfriend looking at me weird. My armpits are soaked and face and neck sweaty. Post commentary. The human body sweats to help it radiate excess heat. It's an evolutionary adaptation that makes us the top predator in the savannas of our ancient past. This type of sweating, however, is known as gustatory sweating and is triggered by a perceived increase in the warmth brought on by the capsaicin binding to your TRPV1 pain receptors. Peppers also have the ability to jumpstart your metabolism and eating really spicy food can actually help you burn a few calories. The increased metabolism also drives further sweating. T plus 45 seconds. I'm not sure if I'm sweating or crying. Maybe both. Girlfriend looks concerned. I'm drinking soda. I heard it helps with the burning, which is intense and everywhere. Seriously, I think I might be on fire inside. Post commentary. Capsaicin isn't easily neutralized by stomach acid, meaning it can continue burning for a long time before fading away naturally. This can make the sufferer feel as if a fire was burning inside them, and the malfunctioning TRPV1 receptors can actually start to convince the brain the body is actually suffering from dramatic overheating, even though body temperature hasn't much changed. This prompts much more sweating to help regulate body temperature. T plus 1 minute 30 seconds. I finally remembered you're supposed to drink milk, so I scared the girlfriend by suddenly rushing to the fridge and gulping down enough milk to refill a cow. I don't think it's helping. I burped, and I swear it felt like fire. I might be turning into an actual dragon. Post commentary. Typically, milk, yogurt, or other dairy products is the preferred pain relieving drink of choice. That's because milk contains a protein called casein, which actually knocks the capsaicinoid off the hijacked pain receptor, helping ease the symptoms. Non fat milk is recommended because of its higher protein to fat percentage. Water is always a terrible choice, as is soda, as all that does is further spread capsaicin around the affected areas. T plus 3 minutes. My nose has been running nonstop, but I think I've stopped crying. Hard to tell through all the sweating. Girlfriend asked me if she should call poison control or a hospital. I told her to call a morgue instead. She didn't think that was funny. The pain is incredible and all over my mouth, throat, and stomach. I can't even begin to imagine what it'll be like coming out the other end. Except I probably can because it's going to be exactly like coming in this end. Post commentary. At this point, the pain is at its peak, and you might start to feel lightheaded from an endorphin rush as the body tries to do its best to block the pain. Certain sexual fetishes that rely on intense physical pain capitalize on this specific response to extreme pain, which is followed by an almost narcotic high-like release of endorphins into the blood. In this case, however, no such release followed, just more pain. T plus 10 minutes. I've been laying on the floor for 5 minutes now. My mouth feels like that time I bit into a freshly microwaved hot pocket as a kid and couldn't taste anything for a week afterwards. I might not be able to taste anything ever again in my life after this. I've dry heaved a few times which was a terrible idea as some of the mashed up pepper made its way back into the bottom of my throat and almost made me puke for real. Girlfriend won't talk to me. She's on the couch and angrily muttering the word stupid under her breath every few seconds. Nose has stopped running but head feels like it might cook my own brain. At this point, I'd welcome that and the sweet release of death. T plus 30 minutes. 
The worst of the burning is over, but my stomach is starting to cramp pretty badly. I hardly ever eat spicy foods and I'm not fond of them at all. I think the cramping is my stomach trying to tear itself free of my esophagus and rip out of my body in a desperate attempt to escape the hell I just fed it. I don't blame you, stomach, even if it does feel like you're carving me up with a steak knife inside. T plus 1 hour 30 minutes. I left the floor about 45 minutes ago and laid down on the bed. Girlfriend came in and offered me milk and angrily told me that if I got the bed all sweaty, I'd have to do laundry. I'd like to stick my stomach in the washer right now and clean out all the bits and pieces of pepper left inside. Still seriously cramping and still definitely not looking forward to what happens on the way out. T plus 18 hours 30 minutes. I was right to be afraid of what would happen on the way out. If the pepper coming in was Mount St. Helens erupting, then it was Mount Vesuvius exploding on the way out. How do people enjoy this? Girlfriend still hardly talking to me, told me my job was stupid before leaving for work. Left a gallon of fresh milk in the fridge though. I went back into the dining room and realized that the second pepper is still there sitting on a plate. I can't believe I thought I would seriously need two of these. Looking at it now, it's only barely two inches long. How could something so tiny hold so much evil inside it? This isn't a pepper, it's the fruit equivalent of Hitler. This is the Hitler installment of peppers. This tiny weird looking pepper isn't even a fruit at all. It's the shriveled up testicle of the Dark Lord Lucifer, full of all the fire and fury of hell itself. We here at the Infographic Show go to great lengths to answer some of your most burning questions, uh, pardon the pun. And today we're happy to put one of our writers through eating the world's hottest pepper for your sake. If you've watched our channel for a while, then you've probably seen any number of videos, such as what to do if your city was a war zone, or how to defend the earth from an alien invasion. In these and many other videos, we often advocate that you do one thing flee the cities. In such a catastrophic scenario, cities will become death traps, and with cities importing all of the food and most of their water that they use, your survival could very well depend on learning to live off the land. So today we're tasking our favorite wilderness lab rat to hit them bricks and teach us all how to survive for three days, eating only what you can catch. Day 1, so I sort of have trust issues with the infographic show. Now, they've typically been upfront about challenges, but they've certainly snuck in a few on me. When I got sent to Hawaii because the fans requested it, I almost had a nervous breakdown because I kept expecting some bomb to drop, like I had to go live inside a volcano for a day or something equally insane. But no weirdness ever came, and it turns out to be just a pleasant little self vacation. Well, a little bit ago, me and the girlfriend underwent a challenge together, and then last week, we got an offer to stay for a few days in a cabin up in the mountains near Big Bear, California. Infographics said that they figured they owed us this much, especially since the girlfriend had to deal with a pretty tough three-day challenge. Consider it a sort of thank you, and we're sorry rolled into one, they said. By the way, yeah, we've seen your comments asking for a face reveal, and we're both really flattered, but take a look at other people's comments and you might see why we prefer to remain as anonymous as possible. We're already worried our poor narrator could get mobbed if someone hears his voice and thinks, hey, that's the guy from the challenges. Oh, and uh, change clothes? Well, obviously, we used a key for that every morning. Even the infographics wouldn't make us wear the same stinky clothes for three days straight. Anyway, we took the offer and made the drive up to the mountains and, sure enough, found a perfectly pleasant little place. Kind of romantic, really. A deck with a gorgeous view, no neighbors for miles, and an outdoor hot tub that overlooks a freaking mountain. Within an hour of arriving, though, my spider sense went off. Something wasn't quite right. Sure enough, I got a call from the show. Oh, hey, while you're up there, we got a challenge for you. No, not both of you, just you. Apparently, I'm always on the clock and the girlfriend deserves her rest. Clearly, Infographics is playing favorites here, or maybe they're secretly terrified of her. So yeah, I should have seen this coming, but basically, I have to eat only what I can catch up here in the mountains for the next three days. Honestly, it should have been obvious the moment that I opened the door to the cabin and found some very basic survival supplies on the kitchen counter. But I sort of figured, I don't know, it's a cabin in the woods. Survival stuff makes sense, right? So the girlfriend had a pretty good laugh. And then she told me she was driving down to the store to pick up her supplies for the three days and wished me luck finding lunch. Alright, so at least they're not making me actually live rough out here. And I do still get the comforts of a cabin to come back to, but this isn't going to be a vacation by any stretch of the imagination. I remember my survival training from the military pretty well, and did you know that animals really don't like getting eaten? They tend to make it incredibly difficult to catch and eat them, really uncooperative. Luckily though, I've had to scrounge with bare 
barely any tools before, and I think only once in my entire six years was I in a situation where we ran out of MREs and actually had to scavenge. Using firearms was not an option because, you know, they're loud and make it easy for bad guys to find you. So I have a pretty good idea of the wildlife in the area, at least, and we're in a really remote area close to Big Bear in SoCal. I spotted several small lakes and I know that on the other side of the mountains where I'm at is desert and at the foot of the mountains is several smaller towns and cities. That's good because it means most animals are going to remain trapped between the peaks and the cities at the foot of the mountains, not crossing over to the other side of the mountains since there's only desert there. I'm thinking that most of my sustenance is going to have to come from fishing because hunting is incredibly difficult. Never mind when you don't have a firearm or even a bow and arrow. You can make a throwing stick with a weighted end which will knock the crap out of a smaller mammal such as a squirrel or a rabbit, but it takes pretty damn good aim. And I'm also pretty confident that I can whip up a few small snares for rabbits, squirrels, and groundhogs, all animals that are pretty abundant in SoCal. There's also deer, but let's face it, venison is tasty but there's no chance of catching one without a true hunting tool. It's still late in the summer so snake is definitely an option, as are several types of lizards that inhabit the area. I'm honestly not picky, and if you want to survive in the wild you better not be either. I almost wish that this challenge was closer to the coast though. The ocean in SoCal is practically teeming with mussels. This isn't going to be easy, but I'm kind of excited. I haven't been in a situation like this for a while, though I guess my homeless challenge came close. It's time to go mano a mano with Mother Nature. Day 1 So the challenge started on the morning of what is technically day 2 of our stay in the cabin. I was already up and out of the cabin well before sunrise. I found on Google Maps that there's a small lake just 6 miles as the crow flies from the cabin, and during summertime fish tend to bite best right before sun up and just after sun down. During the hottest parts of the day they tend to retreat to deeper colder water, so it's not likely that you'll get a bite then. I took a length of string with me, and the night before I spent whittling a few fishing hooks out of wood. The show had included a packet of balloons along with the supplies, which let me know that they knew what they were doing. Balloons are incredibly useful for emergency survival fishing. What I don't have is bait, but that's okay because Mother Nature is full of it if you know where to look. I left around 2.30 am and it took me two and a half hours to make six miles in pretty rough terrain. That wasn't good, because it meant that I'd have to move quick if I wanted to catch anything. As soon as I got to the lake I did a quick survey. I know these lakes are stocked with trout, carp, and bass for sure, but it's best to fish for each in different locations. Bass will typically hide in areas with vegetation where they can ambush prey, while trout prefer areas of clear water where they can keep an eye out on bigger bass trying to eat them. With that in mind, I did a quick scout and picked two different spots. With insects up and about, I knew trout would be coming in close to shore, and odds were good that a few bass would tag along. I lucked out and found a rotting log, and sure enough, after digging into it, I managed to find a virtual treasure trove of large grubs and some beetles. I used these for bait and set them on my wooden hooks. I rigged six hooks on string to six balloons and each hook would hang at a different length than the others, targeting fish at different depths. I inflated the balloons a quarter of the way so they'd act as floaters, keeping the bait suspended in the water and letting me know if I got a bite. Then finally I tied each line to a branch on a tree. So even if a good sized bass snapped one up it wouldn't be able to get away unless my wooden hook snapped, which was a real possibility. I set up my fishing lines around the perimeter of a small cove I found with deep clear water. There was plenty of vegetation pushing up onto the shore itself, which means that this was both a place insects would frequent and accidentally fall into the water. The trout and bass would both know this, so I figured my odds were pretty good. Now it's important to note that this type of fishing is illegal in pretty much every state, but this is technically a survival situation. Plus, infographics can pick up the tab if some ranger managed to find me out here in the ass end of nowhere. I set my lines and waited, and incredibly, three of them hit within half an hour. Two of them were smaller trout, about 8 and 10 inches respectively, which means they were likely still juveniles. Well, sorry, but a man's gotta eat. The third line I suspect hit a bass though because the hook got snapped in two. It takes a really aggressive fish like a bass or a pike to snap a hook like that. It's made out of wood after all. Sadly, there are no pike in Southern California. They make for great fishing and good eating. I reset my two lines and snagged the third trout. My gamble had paid off after all, though I guess you can see by now why this technique is illegal. In an hour I'd already caught three fish. Now in a real survival situation I would have kept fishing as long as I could and simply smoked the meat I couldn't eat. When you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you don't take chances and you get what you can get when you can. This isn't a real survival situation and worse come to worse if I fail to catch more food tomorrow, 
I'd go hungry for a day or two. I honestly rather not take more fish than I needed, and I was confident I could repeat my fishing trip tomorrow. On the way back, I stopped and picked up a few grub. They're about an inch long and really thick around and chock full of protein. You gotta bite the heads off from behind though, or their nasty little pincers can latch onto your lips and tongue, and that hurts like hell. So I came home and found the girlfriend already awake making herself eggs. She was kinda surprised to see me walk in with three fish and start preparing them. I guess she didn't think it would be that easy. Honestly, survival really isn't that easy, and if that lake wasn't nearby, I'd be in a world of trouble. Typically in a survival situation, you spend most of your day just hunting or scavenging, but sometimes you get lucky, like today. The girlfriend was fine with me gutting and filleting a fish, but she freaked when she saw me dump out a handful of grubs from my pocket, then practically fainted when I bit the head off one and popped it in my mouth. Hey, bugs aren't amazing to eat, but food is food and I was in full survival mode. Then I chased her around the house with the remaining grubs until she locked herself in the bathroom. I knew I had enough fish for solid eating for the day, so food was no longer a pressing concern. That let me focus on preparations for tomorrow and improving the tools I had for survival. I whittled more fishing hooks and made a weighted throwing stick by wedging a rock on the end of a large splintered stick and then wrapping it up with string. You can use vines or even long grass to do the same thing. And soon I had a bona fide hunting throwing stick. Though I've never been good with these, so my odds are probably not that great. I decided tomorrow I'd try my hand at catching rabbit, squirrel, or possibly groundhog. Basically, mammal was on the menu. I could have probably lived on fish for a few days, but for the sake of the challenge, I wanted to see how hard it would be to move to land and try to go for harder prey. Small mammals, especially rabbits, tend to follow small tracks through the woods. You can find well-worn paths that lead through the underbrush and give the rabbit a quick method of escape. Rabbits are creatures of habit and will typically use the same paths day after day for weeks and months on end. Luckily, as it's late summer, there should still be plenty of rabbits out and about. Otherwise, it might be best to look for an actual warren. To catch a rabbit, the best tool is a simple snare. You can find all kinds of complex traps to build in survival situations, but snares are simple, easy, and pretty damn effective. Well, if your rabbit actually travels down the path you set it on. That's where the snare simplicity works in your favor, as you can quickly set up these lines in several locations and increase the odds of catching something. Ideally, you'd use metal wire to create the snare, as it'll help keep the circular shape needed. I only have heavy duty string though, so I'll have to improvise. The way a snare works is by forcing the rabbit to try to move through it, at which point the rabbit will hopefully stick his head through the snare, and the force of him trying to escape it will cinch the snare closed. You want to make your loop large enough for the rabbit's head to enter the snare, but not so big that the snare might close around the rabbit's body rather than the head. You really want the snare to cinch tight around the rabbit's neck for a quick, humane death. With no metal wire, I used long, rigid blades of grass I found and interweaved them with the string. Not only will they help keep the circular shape of the snare, but they help camouflage the string as well. With plenty of fish to eat, I spent the day scouting the land around the cabin and identified several locations that looked promising. Tomorrow, hopefully, I would eat meat. Day 2 the best time to hunt rabbit is early in the morning or late in the afternoon, and the best way to hunt rabbits is with dogs. Sadly, I'd have to rely on trapping one instead. I set out at 4 am this time and set up 8 snares along what I hoped were different trails used by rabbits. To set each snare, I found a part of the path where the vegetation closed in and made a natural funnel, then further closed the funnel in with sticks I dug into the ground, sort of like miniature fences on each side. You have to be careful and not make it super obvious, because rabbits are in incredibly skittish animals. But you should work the vegetation to make a narrow enough funnel that the rabbit will more likely than not hit your snare as it's running along. Then I simply hung the snare from an overhead branch. There would be nothing to do until about noon, and my stomach was definitely growling. I wasn't very confident with my snares to be honest, because even if you hit the right path, you still have to get lucky enough for the rabbit to actually run through the snare itself. Odds are never in your favor when snaring or trapping with homemade items. So with the sun rising, I knew that lizards and reptiles would be waking up and moving to warm rocks to absorb the sun and get their cold blood warmed up. That's the perk of hunting a cold-blooded animal. You can be pretty sure of finding them early in the morning if you know where to look and there happens to be the right type of rocky outcroppings in your area. For me though, there were not, so Lizard was off the menu. I found a few warming themselves on the sides of trees, but those things were tiny. My stomach was growling and I started thinking that I might have to resort to fishing. This late in the day though, odds were not good at catching anything there either. Worse come to worse, there was always bugs. Not great tasting, pretty gross, but full of protein and when you're hungry you can't be picky. That's when I came across a snake, easily two and a half feet long. 
Now, years ago I had all the snakes found in Africa and the Middle East practically memorized, but I'll be honest with you, I have no clue about American snakes. All I know is rattlers, and that's it. And this was no rattler. I had no idea if it was venomous or not. And I had to really think about what I was going to do. Was it worth the risk? Yes, I decided, because if this was a real world situation I would take the risk. You do not look a gift horse in the mouth when you're in survival mode, because nature is incredibly fickle and cruel. It must have been around noon then, which meant the snake was fully warmed up and mobile, and that's a shame because it would have been much easier to catch early in the morning while it's still slow after the cold night. I chased it into a tree stump and managed to corner it and then thought carefully about how to do this. It was coiling up, so grabbing it by the tail wasn't an option. And all I had with me was my weighted stick. I doubted I could hit this thing's small head with one throw, so I looked for alternatives. I found a large rock. Perfect. I grabbed the rock and holding it over my head simply smashed it on the snake. Not pretty, certainly not graceful, but that was one dead snake. I picked up my prize and just started heading back home, checking my snares on the way back to find nothing, just as I thought. Honestly, I can't overstate just how much rabbits hate to be eaten. If the girlfriend nearly fainted when I ate grub in front of her, she about died when she saw me bring in a snake. She's not typically girly girl, she's probably one of the toughest people I know to be honest. But while I was going through survival training and all kinds of unpleasantness in the military, she was going to fancy acting academies in New York. Let's just say that all the food she's ever eaten has been nicely wrapped up in plastic at the grocery store. Snake's easy to prepare, just slice it in half and scoop the guts out, then lay in sections over a fire. Turns out this thing was a gopher snake. Totally not dangerous to humans at all, but hey, no reason to take chances. At about two and a half feet long, it wasn't exactly belly filling for an entire day, but enough to live on. Later I checked my snares and still nothing, though one had been knocked aside, a little bastard probably ran right past it. I fixed it and left all the snares up overnight. Day 3. I did not catch a rabbit. Actually, the snares didn't work at all. I found two of them on the ground, which means that a larger animal probably trashed them. No blood though, so it wasn't like a rabbit got snared and then a coyote or bobcat ate my lunch. That's okay, I didn't really think I'd have much luck with the snares. You really, really have to get lucky with those things. Instead, I went fishing again today because I had little faith in snares, and I honestly didn't think I'd get so lucky again with finding another snake. Wildlife is a bit scarce up here to be honest, though I did see several deer. Shame I didn't at least have a compound bow for this challenge. I managed to catch two fish, one of them a bass. That's good, because I much prefer the taste of bass to trout. On the way back home though, I spotted a fat, juicy squirrel just perfectly perched in the middle of a branch that stuck out in a way from all the other branches. It was just sort of sitting there, half paying attention to me, and I happened to have my throwing stick with me. I threw as hard as I could and missed by like three feet. Incredibly, that stupid squirrel just sat there almost like it was taunting me to try again. So I fetched my stick and tried again, this time actually slamming into the tree branch it was perched on. This got it scampering up into the body of the tree, and I knew I'd never catch it then. Also, the impact knocked the rock loose on the stick and I'd have to fix my stick if I wanted to use it again. I told you, animals really try hard to not get eaten. I brought the fish back to the cabin and prepared them, though I had to convince the girlfriend I had no grubs with me before she let me through the front door. Later in the day I checked on the snares, but like I said earlier, never caught anything on them. I decided to just take them all down, since this was my final day. If you're going to hunt, you should always be respectful and responsible. All in all, I didn't do too bad, though I think my survival skills need some sharpening. I got really lucky with the snake on day two, and was even luckier that there was a good lake for fishing nearby the cabin. It's no surprise that early men often set up camp near lakes and rivers. Without fish, we really wouldn't have survived, I think. Without the right tools, land animals are just incredibly hard to catch. As a big perk though, the girlfriend was totally grossed out by me gutting and fixing various animals, but she did say that she thought it was kinda sexy the way I just went out into the woods and provided food. So there you have it guys, if you want girls to like you, prove to them that you can catch wild animals in an emergency, or just buy them food, it worked for me when we started dating. Tin Hut, straighten up there soldier, because today we're taking you to boot camp so you can learn what it's like to leave the civilian world behind and become a soldier in the US military. Well, actually, we went ahead and had our favorite lab rat and a third from the bottom in importance writer go ahead and relive his boot camp days, as we had him live out his life for 30 days like he was back in boot camp. What does boot camp do to a person? How does it change your behavior? Let's find out as you tag along with our boot camp for 30 days challenge. Day 1. 
When I first got this challenge assigned to me, I had such intense flashbacks that I shuddered. I've been out of the military now for a decade after a six year stint, and I can still remember my day one in boot camp like it was yesterday. It wasn't really that shocking a transition going from civilian life to boot camp. My whole family practically is military, and my dad used to be an airborne instructor. I'd trained with his classes as a teenager, and he almost even got permission to have me jump with him during my senior year, but I'd have to wait until I actually joined the military to get my wings. Turns out if anything had gone wrong, it would have been a bureaucratic nightmare, me being a teenager civilian and all that. But I still did PT with them in the morning, even trained on the jump platforms, and yeah, got yelled at just like I was any other recruit. Fun times, but my point is that it wasn't a big shock to transition to boot camp. Boot camp, however, is definitely unpleasant. Though I hear stories about how cake kids today have it. If you went through boot camp recently, can you please let us know in the comments if it was difficult having to eat your filet mignon without steak sauce while your drill instructors cut it up into neat little slices and fed it to you? I realize that I sound like the old timers, how much harder things were in my day. But seriously, from what I've heard of boot lately, it was definitely harder in my day. I guess we were actively at war back then though, and I know that for some of the kids who had no experience with the military, it was jarring to have them see soldiers missing arms and legs for the first time. The point of boot is to break you down, to turn you from a civilian into a soldier, a sailor, an airman, a marine. And that's a pretty drastic transition to make. All the yelling, the screaming, the insults, although I hear they don't do that anymore, and the PT or physical training is all meant to break down your defenses so you can be rebuilt. You're meant to learn discipline, teamwork, leadership, and get mentally and physically tough. Because, let me tell you, there's nothing harder in life than the battlefield. Like the old adage goes, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. So, yeah, even though it makes no sense, the sleep deprivation, the screaming in your face, the constant PT until you're well past physical exhaustion, it's all for a reason. And I can't tell you the number of times once I was in the active military that I was in situations where I was operating well past my mental and physical limits, and awfully glad for the training that had prepared me for these situations. By the way, I hear that in boot camp now, you get 8 straight hours of sleep a night. Wow, do they fluff your pillows for you too before the DIs tuck you into bed with a warm cocoa? So unfortunately, I won't get sent to a real boot camp for 30 days. Instead, I have to live my life as if I were at boot. That means trying to recreate the experience as close as possible in my civilian life, which means a lot of sacrifices are going to have to be made. It's intriguing, really, because I know boot affects you psychologically, but this time I'll get to actually make those observations and write them down. I've taken some measures to make this experience as close as possible to the real thing, though obviously still pretty far from it. First, I've cleared my schedule of any social events. In boot, you don't get any liberty, or at least I didn't, though today you guys probably got weekend water park trips and passes to the fair when you were feeling blue. During my two months at boot, I think I got a grand total of 48 hours of liberty the entire time. So if I didn't get to dip out to the movies back then, I'm not going to now. Secondly, I'm going to leave the apartment I share with my girlfriend and move into my friend's place for the duration. She's a travel blogger and gone frequently to work for magazines, so I'll stay alone at her place. I got to contact family once a week if I was lucky, so I can't be in contact with the girlfriend this whole time except for one hour every week. That includes no texting. Third, I'll be recreating all the PT I used to do, and even doing extra PT as if my unit was being punished, which happens all the time. Fourth, no amenities for the duration except books. No TV, no internet, no video games, just reading books for entertainment and that's it. I'll check in at the end of each week as usual. To be honest, this is not a challenge I'm looking forward to. At real boot camp, you got camaraderie of 30 to 40 other guys, but here I'll pretty much be alone for the whole duration. This one's gonna be tough. Day seven, first week down and man, I remember now all the annoying things I hated about boot camp, though I'm glad there's aspects I'm not having to relive. So my days start at 0445, exactly like in boot. I don't have a very pissed off drill sergeant dragging me out of bed by my foot though, so instead I found some audio recordings of drill instructors screaming and yelling, and each night I set the alarm that automatically triggers the stereo system to play a mix track I made at very loud volume. It's disturbingly close to the real thing and I about had a heart attack the first morning. After waking up, I give myself 10 minutes to make my bed. Yep, hospital corners and everything. I never got the art of hospital corners down, and I used to get yelled at and punished for it constantly. Along with making my bed, I have to be outside and ready for PT by the end of 10 minutes. 
If I'm late, I punish myself with extra PT. Then I do a morning routine alternating between push-ups, jumping jacks, sit-ups, burpees, and mountain climbers, which are all the exercises I can remember. And then I go for a two-mile run while listening to cadences on my earbuds. For those of you who don't know, cadences are those songs that military formations sing as they run, which makes running harder because you're singing while out of breath but in a weird way makes it so much easier because you sort of become part of a machine. You hypnotize yourself into just running and the exhaustion seems far away. After PT, I give myself 20 minutes for the famous three S's, shit, shower, and shave. Those 20 minutes also include completely cleaning the bathroom so that it's spotless. I then inspect the bathroom and if I find anything out of place or dirty, I punish myself. Yep, more PT. Honestly, at this point I'm starting to feel like a masochist. By the way, if you're on your way to boot and you get assigned to clean the toilets or sinks, after you scrub them, rub the porcelain down with your bare hands. Yes, even the toilet. It's gross, but the oils in your skin will make the porcelain shine and make any stray pubic hairs stick to your hand. Just make sure you wash your hands thoroughly afterwards, without messing up a sink all over again, of course. Although, I don't know, maybe in boot camp today they hire maids to clean your toilets and make your bed for you. My absolute least favorite part comes next. Breakfast. Back in boot, we had to eat according to a system. You would form a line along with everyone else, maintaining the position of attention the entire time you were in line. Drill instructors would wander through the line and very swiftly punish anyone whose position of attention wasn't perfect. We shared lunchtime with our entire company though, so there would be hundreds of us, perfectly silent and waiting our turn as the line slowly shuffled forward. Sometimes you'd wait half an hour to finally get your food and sit. When you did get your food though, you had to fill in rows of tables with people starting from the front of the chow hall to the back, and nobody at your table could sit and eat until the entire table was full. Then you would all sit as one and begin eating. You had to eat fast, too, because you only had as long to eat until the table in the row across from you began to fill up. The moment that table was full and those guys sat down, your ass had better be getting up to trash your tray. All in all, you had about three to four minutes to eat as much as you could. I distinctly remember sneaking food out of the chow hall and I never got caught once. So I give myself four minutes to eat and I've tried to recreate a food menu for breakfast, lunch, and dinner as close to possible as what I remember eating. For breakfast, that means a lot of eggs and oatmeal. As soon as the alarm rings, I trash whatever I didn't eat. This first week I found out that I'm definitely rusty and have gone hungry quite a bit. It's amazing how fast you learn to eat when you need to. For the rest of my day, I have a strict time set for lunch and dinner as well as lights out. I also had a friend who programs whip up an app for me as a favor, which randomly sets off an alarm throughout the day. The frequency and timing of the alarm are totally random, but I use it to simulate the countless times throughout the day at basic that you're getting yelled at and disciplined with PT. So every time the alarm goes off, I drop and alternate between push-ups, sit-ups, and burpees. Burpees suck, by the way. I don't watch TV, cruise the internet, or anything like that. Instead, I let myself read for entertainment, and of course I work on my writing. All in all, the experience is definitely not like the real thing, but I feel like I've recreated most of the highlights. The girlfriend is taking this much harder than I am though, especially because she was only allowed to talk to me for one hour today at the end of the week. She has to visit, but that's not possible, so we can only talk on the phone. I think she really, really misses me. Oh, and she was not happy about me shaving my head because, yep, I did that too. Keeping a buzz cut is pretty integral to the experience and I haven't shaved a head since I left basic, mostly because I'm seriously ugly when I'm bald, so very grateful I have great hair genes. Day 14 It turns out that without all the yelling, marching around, time on the firing range, classroom instruction, the boot camp is pretty damn boring. Not being allowed to watch TV, play video games, cruise the internet, or even just go for a drink with friends is extremely boring. I remember now that this was the part I hated most about boot. I didn't care about the yelling and screaming and constant PT, but the isolation and being cut off from the outside world was a killer. If it's hard on me though, it turns out it's way harder on the girlfriend than I ever thought. She has to leave frequently for different movies or shows that she works on, sometimes even for a month or two at a time, but we always have Skype, FaceTime, texting, phone calls. I even send her handwritten letters. Also, if she's gone for more than two weeks, I typically fly out to her or she'll fly to me. Now though, there's practically zero contact between us except for our one hour a week on Sunday. I can tell she's really lonely and she even sounds depressed. This week I kicked up the morning and afternoon PT to three mile runs because two miles is for the first week just to condition you. I really super hate running. 
always did and the military loves to make you run. But I found out that listening to cadences actually makes it easier. I've been slipping back into that weird hypnotic state I used to operate in. Kinda wish I had a group to run with so we could actually sing cadences together. It would make it easier. The alarm app on my phone is driving me insane, although I guess that's the point. Sometimes it goes off 5 minutes after it just went off, so I have to drop down and do another 30 push-ups or burpees I randomly rotate. But I guess that's sort of what happens when I was in boot. Somebody was always messing up, and the military loves to use group punishment to fix mistakes. I've also been waking up each night to do 1 hour fire watch, which I randomly rotate through. So for 1 hour I walk through my friend's empty condo with a flashlight in my hand, and if anyone could see me they probably think I'm the world's biggest weirdo. I am recreating a boot camp experience for the sake of an online entertainment show though, so I guess I am pretty weird. There's not much to report, except boredom. Luckily I'm an avid reader, but I miss the outside world. Day 21 Last week I wrote the girlfriend a letter because I missed her, even though geographically speaking we're only about 8 miles apart. The mailman that delivered that letter must have assumed I was the laziest person in the world. She sent me one back and I immediately remembered how morale boosting it was to get mail in basic, and during my months of training after. If you know anyone in basic training or that's going soon, do them a favor and send them a letter. That goes double if you know anyone who's deployed overseas. Oh, and send the person overseas baby wipes. Seriously, baby wipes are a godsend when you're living in a hole in the desert. Just don't send anyone in basic baby wipes or anything else. One guy in my unit got sent a tin of cookies by his mother, and the drill instructors harassed him for days over it. And they ate his cookies right in front of him. Man, now that I think about it, being a drill would have been a lot of fun. This week the running went up to 4 miles, once in the morning and once in the late afternoon. Honestly, at this point, I might be confusing my basic training with my training for the various schools I went to after basic, but I know for a fact that we did a lot of running either way. I've always stayed in good shape, but because I hate running, doing the 2 miles the first week was killing me. Now I'm kind of surprising myself with the way I'm able to cope with 4 mile runs. I mean, I'm still smoked at the end of it, but I'm not dying the way I thought I would be. This combined with the very fast eating, remember I get 4 minutes for each meal, has made me shed a lot of extra pounds. My abs are absolutely popping now, which makes sense since I basically run like an idiot all day long. I've even learned to eat faster and I typically can finish my entire meal by the time the alarm goes off. It's not pretty, but I manage it. Food in basic is important, which is why they feed you very high calorie stuff to help your body cope with all the PT. You're always left hungry though, and that's why if you did ever pull kitchen duty, oh man, that's a godsend. Yes, you have to clean thousands of dirty dishes and pots and pans, then scrub down an industrial sized kitchen, but your reward is you get to eat whatever you want as slow as you want. Kitchen duty or KP as we called it, was a godsend and I would stuff my face every time I could. My morning breakfast routine reminded me of an incident from basic, though which still haunts me to this day. One of the guys at my table was sick, really badly congested and probably had the flu or a really bad cold. As we're shoveling food into our mouths, suddenly he stops and his body jerks and before he can do anything, he sneezes completely involuntarily. More snot than I've ever seen in my life flew out of his nose and into his oatmeal. Poor kid was so terrified of the drill instructors and so damn hungry that he ate it. He ate oatmeal loaded with mucus. It was the single most disgusting thing I've ever seen, and I randomly remember it to this day. In non vomity food news, this week I've changed my midday meal to MREs, which I snagged from a surplus store nearby. At this point in basic, we started spending a lot of time in the field, and that meant no hot meals, just MREs. Honestly, I've never hated MREs the way some people do. In fact, I always kind of liked them. The jalapeno cheese is off the chain. And I remember that it and the cocoa powder was basically currency. You could literally buy things from people using them. One week and two days left and honestly I can't wait to get back to my normal life. See you guys at the end. Day 30 Today I finally came home and the moment I walked through the door the girlfriend literally threw herself on me, very quickly followed by the dog. She then saw my shaved head and made a gagging sound, which I totally agreed with. My revisit to boot camp days is finally over and I'm very happy about that. I honestly feel it would have been a lot easier to actually go back to boot camp instead of do this weird experiment alone in isolation. The camaraderie of the other recruits really makes the experience in isolation much more manageable. What I experienced was basically very disciplined hermitdom. 
Doing this though did hit on a lot of the core points of the boot camp experience. You really do start to feel completely isolated from the world. In fact, you feel like you aren't even a part of it anymore. That's how complete our quarantine from the real world was. When you deploy, you still get news, TV, internet, phone calls, emails, all kinds of ways to stay in touch. Unless you happen to go really far down range, of course. But at boot, we got none of that. And I definitely nailed that isolation and loneliness. Stepping back into the real world is kind of going to be weird, let alone eating food at a leisurely pace or even eating what I want. I was very strict about my meals and stuck to a plan that resembled what I remember from boot, but now I get to eat what I want again. Tomorrow I'm hitting in and out the moment they open and it's gonna take a SWAT team to get me out. I've reflexively found myself saying sir and ma'am a lot now again. I occasionally got to interact with the outside world during my experience, like having to go to appointments or grocery shopping and I was calling people sir and ma'am constantly. You can always tell when a kid is fresh from boot because every other word out of their mouth is sir or ma'am. There are a lot of things I couldn't simulate, like an FTX or field training exercise. That's typically a big part of the final weeks at boot camp when you go out into the field and live in the weeds for a few days. The constant stress of being yelled at and having aggressive drill instructors in your face is another factor I couldn't simulate, which I feel is pretty much the cornerstone experience of boot camp. The constant PT though is something I definitely did and I had to tell you, it's really easier when you're part of a group. There's something to be said for the way the military makes you do PT with your unit. Being part of a machine, one cog out of many, makes even physically exhausting tasks manageable. I made a deliberate choice to leave the military after six years to find a more peaceful life, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss it intensely at times. Especially the part where you find yourself operating so far past your limits that you look back and can't even see them anymore, and your team is right there beside you. The first time you experience that moment, it's something you just don't forget, and you typically first get your own moment in boot. Depending on what your job ends up being in the military, you might find yourself there often, and it's terrifying, exhilarating, and the most alive you'll ever feel. It's also addicting, and eventually you'll hit that point where you'll have to choose whether you want a shot at living a normal life or not, if your luck doesn't run out first. It's been back to school season in the US for a few months, and that means only one thing for most elementary kids and their parents. It's lice season. The much dreaded tiny animal is notorious for infecting the heads of children, who often don't practice the same hygiene practices that adults do and thus leave themselves vulnerable to infection. All it takes is one child and soon an entire classroom can be host to these tiny little creepy crawlies. But what happens if you actually do get lice, and what's the best treatment for them? Once more, we're turning to our favorite lab rat as we challenge him to deal with a lice infestation. Day 1 – What the actual bleep is literally what I said on the phone with the infographic show after they sent me an email telling me my next challenge. It's back to school season, they said. People want to know about lice, they said. You could help people find out how to treat them, they said. And after a renegotiation of my fee, I finally relented and accepted. The next day, today, I got a package via private courier, and after signing for it, I brought it inside and just stared at it, knowing what was inside. Finally, I opened the box up and revealed several plastic tubes, and inside were what looked like small white dots, except they were moving. I was holding a box full of lice, and pretty soon they were going in my hair, just so I could find out what the best way to destroy them was. Well, I could just chuck them in a fire right now and that sort it out, wouldn't it? But no, that's not what I'm getting paid to do. And believe me, I'm getting paid very well for what I'm about to do. So first, I'm home alone, which is the only way I could do this challenge. The girlfriend is in Canada filming something, or else I know there'd be no way she'd let me do this. She's a clean freak, and infesting myself on purpose with lice ranks up there with, honestly, I don't know. There's nothing I could compare it to, but I'm pretty sure she would make me move out and only allow me back in when she's run me through full military nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare decontamination techniques. I told her over the phone and she just gave off a really deep sigh. I think a year ago she would have put up a fight, but by now she just sort of accepts the insanity I go through sometimes for my job. She made me swear I would boil all of our sheets and basically clean the entire house when it was over and before she got home, so thanks, infographics. Okay, so that's the little effect these buggers are already having on my social life. What can I expect them to do to me physically? Well, lice come in three varieties, head lice, body lice, and the infamous pubic 
pubic lice or crabs. Pubic lice are kind of a misnomer though because any lice you get in your crotch are automatically pubic lice. Basically all lice live amongst your hairs and then move down to your skin so they can bite you and feed on your blood, like tiny disgusting little vampires. The resulting bites can be itchy and though lice are not generally thought to be disease vectors, their bites can be so itchy that you inadvertently tear the skin open and cause infection. Not gonna lie, I am relieved to hear that there's little risk of these things carrying disease. Plus, infographics promised me that they were, quote, laboratory level sterile, end quote. Whatever in the world that means. You know what? I don't want to know. I literally have no desire to know from where in the world infographics got their hands on what are apparently medical quality lice. I did do some research online and apparently you can even get lice in the mail, though, but I very quickly ended my search. So I'm going to be testing a variety of different treatments for getting rid of lice. And I'll be purposefully pouring them into my hair. I've never had pubic lice and never intend to, so that's off limits. I'll start with some homeopathic remedies and then move on to the real stuff, actual medicine. Spoiler alert, homopathy is not a thing, so I'm confident none of those remedies will actually work, hence why I saved the real medicine for last. The treatments I'll try are tea tree oil, lavender oil, vodka, yes you heard that right, and finally actual medicine in the form of shampoo designed to kill lice and their eggs. Looking at this list I'm actually kind of thinking the vodka may have a pretty good chance of killing off the lice along with the shampoo, and I'm talking about real vodka here not the wimpy stuff you buy at the grocery store. I once was assigned to teach firearms handling to Ukrainian forces and they introduced me to Ukrainian vodka so strong it'll strip rust off of steel bolts, and you can totally buy it online. My first try nearly burned a hole through my gut, so I'm pretty confident this is going to destroy the lice. Treatment 1. Tea Tree Oil Ok, so lice went in the hair a few days ago and per the instructions I was given, I gave them a day to settle in. You know, unpack their bags, get used to their new home, which is my freaking head. But also because apparently these guys do not live very long without human or animal hosts because they starve to death, which explains why I was sent so many lice at once. Apparently at least half of them were probably dead already. Their one free day was so they could feed and recuperate, and if you don't think I was freaking out over purposefully playing host to a bunch of bugs in my hair, then you're thinking wrong. We love tea tree oil, don't we? I mean, you saw it touted online as the solution to literally anything. Apparently aboriginals in Australia used it for its medicinal properties for thousands of years, and it does have some medicinal qualities to it. And it's all natural, which means overprivileged first worlders geek out and pay a 3000% markup for it. I get it, it just feels good to use something all natural, just like mother nature intended. Don't take harsh chemicals or drugs, just fall into the loving arms of mother Gaia and let her love heal the hurt away with all the natural vibes, except it didn't work at all. And I applied it extremely generously to my head and let it sit for half an hour, then rinsed it out, got out a knit comb I picked up at the store and started going through my hair. There were a number of clearly dead lice, but it seems like most were happily moving around, going about their lives, probably thanking me for the all organic bath they just had while going to their local lice Starbucks for a nice lice frappuccino made from fair trade beans. So I repeated the treatment again a day later, once more doused my head with tea tree oil, let it sit, rinsed it out, ran a comb through my hair, same result. Not as many dead lice as the first time, still plenty of living lice. I did it one more time, exact same result. So tea tree oil clearly has some anti-lice properties, but as the problem with every homeopathic treatment, those properties are in too low concentrations to really have a definitive effect. That's why drugs and chemical treatments are so much more effective. They concentrate the effective ingredients to a level that homopathy doesn't even approach. If you're a fan of TED Talks, there's one given by James Randi where he eats an entire bottle of homeopathic medicine at once, which he can of course totally do because the only active ingredients in the entire bottle are in such low quantities that they have practically no effect on the body. Try that with real medicine though and well, you'll probably really hurt yourself. Treatment 2. Lavender Oil so I gave my little buddies a few days to recuperate from the tea tree oil and my head's been an itchy mess. I've purposely been not leaving the house because, well I have a head full of lice, so other than dealing with itchiness, it's been kind of lonely and boring. Also I miss my girlfriend, but I'm glad she's not here to deal with this. Alright, lavender oil, how does it work? Well if possible lavender oil worked even less than tea tree oil, which I would label about 50% effective. I'm giving lavender oil about 30% effective and I'm pretty sure that none of the dead lice I found were actually killed by anything in the oil itself, probably just drowned to death. 
If you go to clearlice.com and look up lavender oil, it'll tell you about how evil over-the-counter medicines and shampoos are dangerous for you. They use hot-button words like chemicals and pesticides and neurological and developmental problems. What they don't do is give you any perspective. Yes, the chemicals involved in over-the-counter treatments could in fact be harmful, but only if you were to consume them in astronomically high doses. One of those chemicals, permethrin, is found in many lice shampoo treatments, but if you search for its toxicity, you'll find the dose at which it becomes lethal for 50% of test rats exposed to it is 270 mg per kilogram of body weight, and even then if only injected directly into the veins of the animal. When you extrapolate that to human toxicity, toxicity, you'll basically have to inject an entire bottle of lice shampoo directly into your veins for it to have a 50% chance of killing you. Honestly, if you're getting adverse effects from lice shampoo, it's probably because you're supposed to be using it on your head, not injecting it into your freaking veins. Oh, also at clearlice.com they explicitly say that lavender oil does not kill lice, yet thousands of websites recommend it as an all-natural treatment. That's kind of hilarious. Treatment 3. Vodka Hey, you know what's super not a good idea? Pouring 170 proof vodka imported from Eastern Europe directly onto your scalp. Do you guys remember the terrible Ghost Rider movie? Yeah, that's exactly what my head felt like after bending over in front of the tub and pouring very strong and very expensive vodka into my hair. I'm not gonna lie, I tried it once only because I can take feeling like I'm being chemically scalped once in my life. I hear it's a popular remedy in Russia, but Russians also commonly throw babies into snowbanks before major surgeries to slow their heart rates. I'm not saying it's not effective, I'm just saying there's more non-Russian ways of doing things. As far as killing lice, honestly, I don't know. I couldn't even stand touching my head for a day after this, so I didn't even bother checking. Pretty sure all I did was give my head lice the best party of their life. Treatment 4. Actual Medicine Okay, so my final treatment I went ahead and consulted with a pharmacist who recommended a specific type of shampoo. Apparently lice are becoming resistant to the chemicals we've been using for decades, which makes sense, that's just how evolution goes. So the pharmacist recommended a shampoo that uses dimeticone, or a type of silicone. If you love homopathy and fear chemicals, then this is the stuff for you because it kills lice mechanically, rather than with chemicals that attack its biology. The dimeticone physically coats the lice and essentially makes it impossible for them them to breathe, which kills them. It's less effective on eggs, but that's why you're supposed to continue the treatment over the course of several days, killing the new generation before it has a chance to lay eggs. So that's what I did. And let me tell you, this stuff stinks. It smells really strong, and you have to leave it in for several hours, which is not a huge selling point to be honest. But later that night, I rinsed it out and ran a comb through my hair and found more dead lice than I've found to date with any other treatment. I kept repeating the treatment and each day I was finding less and less live lice. This was clearly the most effective method I've tried yet. It's now been a week since my last treatment, and I'm happy to report that I appear to be 100% lice-free. This has been a horrible past few weeks, and one of the grossest challenges I've done, but I'll take some small satisfaction in knowing that I murdered an entire generation of lice while they were still virgins. Small payback, but I'll take it. Alright, I know you guys can't see anything. Maybe you can hear it if you're really quiet. Something's knocking wood on wood, not too far from our camp. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Bukwas, Oma. Something large and man-like has allegedly been stalking the North American forests for as long as humans have lived there. So naturally, we sent your favorite lab rat to a remote location in Oregon to settle an office bet and discover if Bigfoot is real or just a bunch of hooey. Oh, and this time, we gave him a camera. Alright, info fans, you asked for it. A live challenge to prove that yes, somebody on the infographic show's staff really does do things like freeze his butt off at 8,000 feet elevation on the side of a mountain to try to find Bigfoot. Now when I got this challenge, I was ecstatic because I love doing potentially terrifying and dangerous things, except ghosts. And what could be more dangerous than tracking down an 800-pound great ape in the very remote wilderness? I tried to rope the girlfriend in on it, but she's more of a Hilton resort than camping out in the middle of nowhere type girl. So instead, I got my friends Matt, Lauren, and Emily in on it. My friend Matt, a real person you can follow on Instagram at matthew.scott.miller, is a fellow veteran and experienced hunter. Like me, he's interested in the more scientific side of Bigfoot. If you've been a longtime fan of the show, you might remember Emily from an episode we did featuring her on the life of an Instagram influencer. You can find her on IG at Emily Make It Rainy. 
she has no opinion on Bigfoot and came for the adventure. Our final team member Lauren thinks Bigfoot is an alien. Bigfoot is definitely not an alien, but you can follow her at Lauren.Burns. For this special challenge, the infographics show provided us with some very basic equipment. When I say basic, I mean basic. They weren't exactly breaking the bank here on gearing us up. So if you want a follow up episode, get this video over a million views and then bug infographics to buy us better gear for a new expedition. Our research location was on a mountain in central Oregon where there have been a slew of very recent sightings. Disturbingly, in the months leading up to our expedition, I discovered that ranchers have been reporting mutilated cows. With the added bonus of running into aliens, this was already proving to be a potentially terrifying trip. I kissed the girlfriend goodbye, promised not to get eaten by either Bigfoot or a bear, and we drove 15 hours to Oregon. To get to our location, we had to travel for hours on back roads and then follow a gravel road up a mountain and then take a dirt road until we found a suitable camping site. As you can see, we were basically in the absolute middle of nowhere. We set up camp and got a fire going because the temperature was already hovering at just above 50 degrees. And as we were in the middle of preparing a fire though, we got a waft of something awful blowing into the camp. A very distinct sewer slash skunky smell. Now bears have a very distinct wet dog and rotting meat smell, but this was very different and all of us described it the same way. Most Bigfoot encounter reports all start with the smell described in the exact same way, hence the nickname skunk ape that some people use. This was really good news, but a sweep of the perimeter of our campsite revealed nothing. This would only be the start of activity around our camp though. Another commonly reported phenomenon is wood knocking sounds, as if very large branches are being used to rhythmically pound on the side of a tree. Some people have knocked back things and gotten responses. Figure I'd try some wood knocks myself, if anything just to let things in the area know that we were here. In my research I was told that the best chance to have an encounter was close to camp, so our strategy on this trip was to encourage any potential Bigfoot to come in close. The problem with wood knocking is that Oregon's a very wet place, and well, you can see my difficulties. Hopefully this stick doesn't break the moment I hit it. All these sticks are super soggy. Yo, shattered. All right, let's try tree knock again with a slightly. This thing's gonna fucking break. Eventually though, I managed to find a stick that didn't immediately disintegrate. Though it and the tree I chose were so wet, the knocks were really muffled. We had one trail camera the show got for us, so we decided that the best use of it was to have it watching our truck. My theory was that because the truck was a good distance from our camp, a potential Bigfoot might be comfortable checking it out. It's working. Did you bring something for us to look at these while we're here? <laughs> Remember how we talked about laptops? Yeah, I thought the same thing. We don't need electronics. Matt did bring up a good point. We had nothing with which to check the camera's footage every day because none of us brought laptops. With only a few hours of daylight left, we stayed at the camp and turned into our tents. Shortly after we had all turned in, something brushed along the side of my tent. It then went to Lauren's tent and actually poked around near the bottom of her tent as if it were trying to see if there was a way in at the bottom. We all later agreed it was likely a curious bear. On day two, we hiked a few miles west of camp, looking to scout out a location where we could set up a night stakeout later that day. We found a large clearing several hundred yards wide and long and just inside the tree line found our first track. Now the thing to remember is that you're looking at a flat two-dimensional image so you can't see the details that we could easily see in person. However, if you look close enough, you can clearly see the indentation of several toes and a well-defined heel. I only put up a visual guide around the track itself. I didn't want to highlight the toes or other details because I wanted viewers to spot the details for themselves. After all, this track certainly looked very human-like to us out in the field, but maybe our brain was playing a trick on us. I didn't want you to also be fooled by me highlighting what I wanted you to see, because maybe some of you see something differently and we can get a positive ID on this and many other tracks we found. What was curious about this track was that even though there were very clearly defined toes, it was very much human-sized. Somebody running around barefoot could very well have left the track behind. 
though I'd wonder who would be insane enough to be running barefoot in freezing cold weather on the side of a mountain. As we'd soon find out though, there was a significant amount of these human-sized barefoot tracks, and then Lauren offered an insight that made a lot of sense. If Bigfoot is a real animal, it probably has infants and teenagers that aren't fully grown. It didn't take very long to find what might have been a dad footprint. Again, sadly, you can't see the fine details we saw because our photograph is only two-dimensional, but this footprint stood out to us immediately. The front toes were clearly visible, as well as once more the deep heel imprint. When Matt placed his foot above it, you could also see how truly massive this footprint was. Placing his heel up where the toes were, his own toes were still a good four inches shy of the print's heel. What was also curious is the depth of the tracks we were finding. Simply put, something very, very heavy was leaving these tracks behind, because none of us could match the soil depth of each print, even when we tried our best. Yeah, because that it looks sort of like, I mean, small toes, but toes. And the thing is, when I try to press into the soil, even if I'm pressing hard, look, there's literally no depth to my track. There's like a few centimeters of death there. In hindsight, we should have probably brought plaster so we could have cast these prints, but what can I say? We are Bigfoot amateurs. About a half hour later, the group once more got hit by the same sewer skunky smell that we picked up shortly after arriving at our site. Then, to our surprise, there was the sound of splintering wood. Rushing to investigate, we found a tree that had just been torn out of the ground. So this oh, yeah. is what got my attention. I looked for tracks. Because this is super fresh. That's true. If you were to poppy down, you smell the smell. Yeah, that is. There's no other tracks. You guys don't see any other yeah, tracks, do you? This is the direction the smell came from, too. Yeah. Is this the now, limbs being broken and trees getting pushed over is a very commonly reported phenomenon with Bigfoot encounters, with people all over North America reporting the exact same behavior. It's considered an intimidation display, and is actually behavior that great apes in Africa also exhibit. Something did not want us in the area. By the way, I know what most of you are thinking right now. Why didn't you get it on camera? Well, keep in mind that we didn't have a dedicated cameraman the way a TV show does, and we weren't exactly as well equipped as a TV production may be, so none of us were constantly running our cameras or phones. We stayed put for a bit, eating some snacks and seeing if anything would approach, but nothing did, so we continued pushing into the woods and eventually came across more tracks that were eerily similar in size to the smaller, human-like tracks we found earlier. I was skeptical of these being legit tracks, but as Matt pointed out, they could have been very old and thus washed out. Also, the fact that we found more tracks just like those two nearby started to lend credence to the theory that these were legitimate prints after all. If not, something was causing human foot-shaped tracks that all looked exactly the same to appear in a muddy area. And as much as I wanted to be skeptical, it was hard to deny that we kept finding tracks that looked exactly the same all in the same vicinity. With evening approaching, we headed back to camp to eat dinner and prepare for our night stakeout. On the walk back, I learned Oregon's mountain weather has ADHD because it began raining on us, which turned to hail, which died out all in the span of 20 minutes. It kind of stings. And it's dying out. This wouldn't be the first time it happened. Matter of fact, on our third day, we went from bright sunshine to rain to hail, back to sunshine, then to rain and sunshine again, all in the span of 90 minutes. We were well prepared, but it became quite annoying to be constantly swapping rain and cold weather gear in and out of your backpack every 20 minutes. After dinner, we prepared for our night stakeout. My strategy was simple, use the girls as Bigfoot bait. Native American folklore is full of warnings that women and children should be careful out in the woods alone, as they attract Bigfoot attention. Contemporary sighting reports affirm this fact, and researchers everywhere will tell you the sound of women and children lures in Bigfoot. This, again, is also a known great ape trait, with many ape species showing a natural curiosity for women and children, and an avoidance for men, which makes all kind of sense, evolutionarily speaking. All right, so this is going to be our first night stakeout with the girls acting as bait. That's right, what, uh, lots of giggling. <laughs> the sun's going to go down here soon. What are your thoughts, Emily, about being bait? <laughs> um, well, 
my thoughts are I want to see Bigfoot, but I'm also terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. I do feel good that you guys will be like pretty nearby hiding. Yeah. Protection, but. Um, One day we should bring the shoddy, actually. Yes. Just in case. Just in case. Just in case. Lauren, how do you feel about being bait tonight? Ah, Bigfoot and I are going to be good friends. I got an apple for a peace offering. He's a lot smarter like than that. people give him credit for. I'm more worried about Eve being eaten by a bear, so. You mean like a bear that would be after the apples you're holding? <laughs> I'll throw the apples. Actually, yeah, I'm going the other way. <laughs> The plan was to return to the wide open field we discovered that was very close to where we heard that tree being pushed over near us and found all those tracks. Then the girls would sit in their camping chairs in the middle of the field while Matt and I hid in a tree line and watched them with our night vision. Also, for safety, we'd be armed. You know, just in case. You'd think that the girls would have been afraid to sit in the middle of the field alone in the dark <laughs> as bait, but they were pretty brave. All right, so we have the girls in position. Those are their headlamps out there. We're watching over them with night vision. And uh, I don't know if you guys can hear, but these frogs should let us know if something's in the area. Because frogs are nature's alarm system. I radioed the girls and told them to periodically laugh really loudly so anything in the general area would be able to hear them and hopefully come in for a closer look. The fact that frogs were present was very lucky for us because frogs will immediately go quiet in the presence of a large animal not wishing to end up as its lunch. It really did make for a perfect natural alarm system, and we wouldn't have to wait long. About 45 minutes into our stakeout, the frogs went completely silent. Then there was a slight tremor in the earth. What was strangest of all though is that it wasn't until we got back home and reviewed the footage that we discovered a strange hum that we hadn't been able to hear when we were physically there in recording. Frogs went quiet for a while, and then you felt the ground shake. Maybe they felt a tremor too. I shot that clip on my own iPhone, and there's no similar humming sound in any other clip I shot out there, nor has there ever been that sound in anything I've recorded in the two years I've owned that phone. After the ground shaking incident, the frogs returned to normal, but a few minutes later they went deathly quiet again. Looking around with the night vision, I almost jumped out of my pants when, as I was scanning the tree line in the direction of the frogs, I saw what first looked like a hairy face poking out and looking at me sideways. Took a moment to realize it was just a tree limb with something on them reflecting the infrared light that made it look like eyes. We stayed put for a while longer, but ultimately, nothing happened. So we made our way back to camp in the pitch black, and I do mean pitch black. With cloud cover overhead and the wind periodically howling, we couldn't see or hear anything. There could very well have been a Bigfoot 10 feet away from us just off the road and we would have completely missed it. The next morning, Matt got woken up before everyone else by strange sounds just east of our campsite. This morning I went and did a perimeter check around the camp at about 7.30 just to check for anything. Uh, I couldn't find anything within about 100 meters. So I came back to camp to get the camera because I had this feeling I needed it. I went out that way. I had the camera pointed, uh, I guess, east, and when I was out there, I was kind of looking off to the south, but I had the camera pointed to the east, and I heard what sounded like a tree fall over, like just very slowly, lasted about two or three seconds. Uh, so I kept the camera pointed down range for a bit, didn't move, just listened. I heard something walking away, and that's when I noticed something pretty large black walked down the hill. So I kind of stood there for a minute to see if I could get it on camera. I'm not sure if I did, the screen's kind of small. And then I just kind of went around and followed it down. You know, it looks like it went across the road. And then uh, I came back to camp to get everybody. All right, before we get into the footage of the event that he shot, few notes. First, we were not using a professional grade camera. Basically, we had an off-the-shelf camera with a built-in microphone. If you're disappointed, like I said before, get this video to over a million views and blow up Infographics Inbox demanding a new trip with better equipment. With that being said, we didn't expect that we would have picked up much of what Matt had experienced. 
We were pleasantly surprised that the tiny microphone on the camera did pick up several things. It's been reported that Bigfoot will often work together, with one serving to distract a human that gets too close while the others get away. People have often reported hearing a tree knock or a similar sound from one direction and then catching a brief glimpse of something large running away in another direction, a lot like what Matt experienced. Thanks to the crappy little onboard mic, you're going to have to turn your speakers up. Listen for when Matt clears his throat and the sound of a knock immediately afterwards. <clears throat> Did you hear it? Listen again, right after he clears his throat. <clears throat> Sadly, that's all that got captured on camera. Whatever large black thing Matt saw, he wasn't aiming the camera in the right direction when he noticed it. After he came back to camp and woke me up, we let the girls sleep in and went to see if we could find any tracks. The first thing we found was something that was becoming extremely familiar to us, more freshly broken branches. Now branches break all the time in the forest, but green, healthy branches breaking off trees with no snow load or high winds is very difficult to explain, especially when it just so happens that Matt had heard branch breaking noises that very morning. The first branch we found was about 100 meters from our camp in the direction that Matt had spotted the large black creature before it melted into the tree line. Alright, so the edge is about an inch and a half in diameter. There is a small one there, but it's not that big. Next we found a potential track near the dirt road that ran north of the campsite. The direction of the track matched the direction of travel that the large black figure Matt had seen was moving in. Once more, there was the strong indication of toes, but because of the mossy ground, any track would have left very little details behind. As usual, what was impressive about the track was the sheer depth of it, something which once more we couldn't replicate ourselves no matter how hard we tried. Yeah, I blatantly see that. I mean, I don't know. It's not just me, like, it kind of looks like there's a few toes in there. It does. Uh, if you can see right there. We found light impressions in the gravel nearby, but honestly, those could have been anything. We decided to move across the dirt road and down into the brush to see if we could pick up a trail. If we found more impressions that looked similar, we could possibly verify that what we had found was indeed a real track, and not just a weird hole. Unfortunately, the ground all around this area was not conducive to leaving tracks. It was very hard ground with a layer of tree litter, but we struck gold when we discovered another massive potential track. Oh, I see that. That is a... Hell of an imprint. I mean, that big. Yeah, but is it a print or is it a hole? I don't know. Here's my foot for comparison. Size 14. I mean, that's that's massive. Unfortunately, is a lot of the grass is laying down, mm -hmm. so I can't really tell if it was standing up and then it got pushed down. Right. This was perhaps one of the clearest tracks we had found, with very identifiable toes. If you compare it to what a traditional Bigfoot track looks like, it is eerily similar in size and shape. Where we got lucky is that if this was in fact a Bigfoot track, then the animal stepped right onto the mossy mound surrounding a tree stump, which was absolutely crushed by the sheer weight. What made us believe this wasn't likely to be a random foot-shaped hole was not only once more the possible impression of toes, but the fact that the grass all around the track was obviously impacted. We were lucky the animal stepped onto that mossy ground, because the hard ground all around it simply wasn't conducive to leaving tracks. We couldn't find an accompanying track, but with an estimated stride length of up to 10 feet, the animal could have easily cleared the mossy mound with one stride and not left a second print for us to find. After being gone for an hour, we decided to head back to camp, since none of the girls knew how to operate a gun and we had seen plenty of signs of recent bear activity. Once we got back though, bad weather moved in on us within minutes and it seemed like we'd have to spend the day huddled in our tents.
We ducked into our large communal tent and played Uno for about an hour before the weather changed its mind, and next thing we knew it was bright sunshine. And that's how the weather works when you're high up on a mountain. For the day's adventure, we decided to hike northwest to a creek that we knew was in the area. With so much bad weather washing out tracks and making them hard to spot, I figured our best chance to find fresh tracks would be along the muddy creek banks. Also, it was the largest source of water around and every animal has to drink. On the way, we came across a large clearing where we took a break, and Matt used the opportunity to recon the area from the sky using his drone. We were able to pinpoint the location of large clearings we could set up additional nighttime stakeouts in. Since Bigfoot is widely reported to hunt deer, a clearing would be the perfect place for one to try to run a deer down, so hopefully we'd get lucky. By the way, you guys have been asking for a face reveal, well, here you go. There, did you spot me in the far right corner of the frame? We got to the creek and had to push our way through pretty thick brush as we followed it downstream, not finding much along the banks. About half a mile out from where we entered the thick woods, though, we found more of a phenomenon which was becoming extremely familiar to us, more freshly ripped off branches. So we got fresh break. Oh yeah, this is really fresh. And then the other half is down there. But None of these branches. It doesn't look like it fits anywhere. I mean, this is like the size of a small tree. Of all the breaks and pushed over trees we found, this was probably one of the most interesting. And as usual, the downed branch did not match any of the trees near it, begging the question of how it got there. This tree, this limb rather. I mean, first of all, if this fell naturally, I could believe it fell naturally if this half wasn't, wasn't literally laid on the floor over there. This, must have been torn down and then something just ripped the other half over there off and did it very recently. This goes pretty well. Do you find As we continued to follow the creek in a southerly direction, we came across a new track. And for those skeptics watching who think we can't spot a double step bear track, well, here you go. There's the claw marks. Yep, that's a big bear. What a nice bear print. Wow. Doesn't seem very old either. It is. It's got to be at least one day because there's spider wow. in oh, it. Oh, I see that. You'll notice the same thing anybody with expertise in the outdoors will. This bear print looked oh. nothing like the human like prints we were finding. Next, we found something that I would love any skeptic to explain to me as being naturally caused. Two young but still large trees ripped right out of the ground and laid down side by side. So two small trees, not sawed, not cut, pushed over, say, okay, well, it's just a tree fall. Trees fall in the forest. How did two fall at the same time and where's the stumps? There's no stumps anywhere near these trees. So something moved these trees here. Lauren thought they might have been the tops of still living trees, which was not a bad hypothesis since she could spot one tree close by that had it stopped missing. When we investigated though, the brake pattern on that tree didn't match the brake patterns on the ones on the ground and the species of tree was also wrong. As usual, these trees or tops of trees didn't match any of the trees nearby, indicating something had to have moved them to their current locations and laid them down side by side. To our surprise though, that wasn't the only object that had clearly been ripped out of the ground and moved. Very close to the two broken trees, we found a signpost that had no business of being there. 
So about 30 meters from the two trees, there is a signpost that got broken and dragged out here. Uh, the problem is by now we're at least half a mile from the road. So who broke a signpost and then dragged it a half mile into the woods? Okay, second question. Who rips a signpost out of the ground and then drags it a half mile into the woods to hide it? Through my research, I found that this is also a commonly reported Bigfoot behavior ripping down signposts and discarding them deep in the woods. It's believed that it has something to do with Bigfoot being a territorial animal, with the very scary conclusion being that if that's the case, then it means Bigfoot is smart enough to recognize the purpose of a signpost. I don't think anyone's comfortable with the idea of an intelligent great ape in our woods, though it would go a long way toward explaining how they've remained so elusive. Next though would be my own absolutely terrifying close encounter. After an hour of hiking, I felt the call of nature and I got the urge to drop a load of bottom brownies. I moved about 30 meters away from the group for privacy, took a quick look around, then dropped my trousers and did my business. And what happened next? Well, something huge just made a giant snorting, grunting sound and broke a bunch of branches right as I started to poop. So, believe me, that was the fastest I have ever wiped. Let me explain. Just as I did my business, something extremely large broke a bunch of branches approximately 20 feet away from me in the thick brush, then gave off a huge snorting growl and started running. Almost at the same time, Lauren, who was 30 meters downhill from me, spotted a huge dark shape running through the tree line. Was Bigfoot watching me poop? Not quite. Later, we caught sight of two bears running away together through the trees. It does, however, highlight how a very big animal can remain completely unseen within just feet of you in the thick brush. Also, I found it curious that when it happened, I wasn't so much scared of being killed by a bear as much as I was scared of being killed by a bear while my pants were still around my ankles. This isn't how I'd want my girlfriend to hear of my passing away. Pushing back toward the gravel road nearby, we came across yet another find that was frankly becoming so commonplace it was barely worth noting anymore. All right. Same thing. Another very large broken branch. Fairly fresh. These still aren't too crispy. And there are absolutely no trees in the immediate vicinity that it could have come from. Because all of these are almost dead. So who or what dragged it out here? By now it was getting into the afternoon, so we headed back to camp for lunch. On our way back to camp though, we made a discovery. As I mentioned earlier, my goal was to always try to lure a Bigfoot close to our camp, knowing that that'd be the best chance of recording any activity. Well, when we got back to camp... Alright guys, so... Before we left for the first half of our investigation today, I took a shiny red apple and stuck it on the tree stump, tree stump up here. And as I was going back to the truck to open our cooler and get some hot dogs for lunch, I happened to look over and realized it's gone. The apple is gone. And it was right here. Looking for prints, impressions. No, I'm not saying this was Bigfoot by any means. Anything could have taken that apple. But it's curious when I show you what we found at camp here in a second. 
And what did we find smack dab in the middle of our campsite? Well, it seems we had a visitor while we were gone. So this is what we found when we got back to camp today. Very large, what looks like a trap and toes. Can't quite see a fifth toe, but can barely clearly see what might be toes up there. And there's plants that have been crushed down. If you compare my, even if I put a lot of force into it, I can barely make an impression. So whatever this was, had to be quite heavy. Hoping to encourage whatever had taken our apple and possibly walked through our camp to stick around, I went back to the tree stump and put up another apple. This time, though, I stuck it to the end of a tree branch about six and a half feet high. We wouldn't have to wait long for activity. About half an hour after setting the second apple up, the group heard a loud yelp type noise. Not like how a dog might yelp, instead with a lot more bass to it, as if the animal was significantly larger. Then a few minutes later, I was talking to the group and something large huffed very loudly from behind us and in the direction of that apple. Maybe you don't want to check right now though. All right, we heard a yelp about what, five minutes ago? And then I was in the middle of a story when suddenly something huffed at us from right behind us. I was in the middle of talking, so I wasn't sure if like, I actually had heard it. So I'm Just a short while later, we all heard yet another vocalization. All right, so we've been at camp getting warm for a bit because it started raining. And so far we've heard two yelps that sounded pretty distant. Then we heard a very loud grunt that sounded really close. And about a minute ago, we all heard, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, a very loud, very long moaning yell. From over in this direction. Although it was definitely, definitely sounded far. Uh, we're planning on doing the night stake out in that exact direction, as a matter of fact. So, hopefully we see what made that sound, because that was eerie. About this time, I had a hunch that I should check our apple gifting spot. So guess what? We came back, and the second apple that I put up, I stuck it up here, is gone. And that is, can you stand in for height comparison? So, how tall are you? I'm 6'2". Six 6'2", two. Six two, so that's about, what, 6'6 six six or so? Yeah. That second yeah. apple wouldn't stay missing for long. All right, so we're still where the second apple got taken. We have walked this road down to our camp at least four times today. And I've personally walked it two times extra. And when well, we just noticed that the apple was taken, which was about an hour and a half after I set it out there, there's a fresh branch on the road, which is kind of weird. You found the apple? Oh shit, there it is. I can tell which one if the right part is. <clears throat> okay. Maybe we've got teeth and prints. Let's look for tracks. I mean, that's a little rude to not eat the whole apple. Right. 
I'm not seeing any tracks. I'm gonna get close. I mean, it's trampled. Something's. Look, it's the two apples. Oh, interesting. They're in the same spot. Yep, it's the two apples in the same spot. It's from the first wall, first or second. There's imprints here, but impossible to tell what they are. What do you think? What was most perplexing, however, was the fact that whatever had eaten the first apple had eaten all of it, including the core, but took the time to peel the skin off where the sticker was. Possibly. It could be a squirrel. So what if, all right, something ate this entire apple, because obviously this is not part of that. Something ate this entire apple was smart enough to not eat the sticker, so it discarded the sticker. Whoever comes back for a second apple, takes maybe one or two bites, and then just tosses it. And then, yeah, the rodents could easily get to it then. Yeah. Definitely. Tooth mark right there. Yeah, I see that. I just have a very hard time believing that rodents would eat everything except the sticker. And leave it. It's so perfect, you know? Mm -hmm. There's not even any chew marks on it whatsoever. Yeah. And I would use just that. We decided to push our luck with whatever was taking our apples. So this is our third experiment with gifting. This time, we're trying to lure them closer to that stump. And the tree where the first two apples were is right over there. Our camp's right down there to the left of the truck. We're trying to lure them gradually closer to encourage an interaction at the campsite tonight or tomorrow night. But this time, we want to eliminate the possibility of rodents. So we thought, let's string a banana up tall enough that a normal animal can't get to it and in a way that a squirrel can't simply climb up and pry it loose. So, we have the banana hanging up. Now, my only concern is that bananas are obviously not native to Oregon. So, it might be a little confused and maybe won't see it as a food item but maybe you'll get curious. Sadly, the banana was never touched, but in an attempt to disprove that our apples were being taken by squirrels, deer, bears, or anything normal, I made a bit of a shocking discovery. So Matt brought up a good point about squirrels taking our apples. This apple has been perched here for the last... When did we put this one up? Yeah, so this apple's been here for two days completely untouched. If yeah, we got apple seeding squirrels out here, you think they would have gone for this one by now. And yet, nothing. Now it just so happens. Oh shit. Hey, my other apple's gone. I did. <laughs> I put it up yesterday. The one apple that's close to the camera is still there. Yeah, um, I should have checked that apple earlier today. I just, I kept checking it yesterday and it was still there. So I figured, uh, whatever. I'm not gonna check it today, it's probably still there. Now it's gone and I put this one up high. Like, I climbed up on here. You can still see my scuff marks and I stabbed it right up there. That's, that's gotta be like eight feet up.
I'm not finding any pieces of the apple on the ground. Damn, I should have checked that apple earlier today, but I just didn't think to. I thought for sure it'd still be there. Someone, please start explaining in the comment section why any known animal would take all of our apples, even the one placed over 8 feet high up in a tree, and yet completely ignore the apple 10 feet from our trail camera. Couldn't be because of our scent, because our scent was already all over the apples and the trees I placed the apples on. And just so it's clear, our camera is there, apple's there. Now the camera is not pointed at the apple, but this apple is near the camera. And by the way, we didn't put the apple in front of the camera because we've heard so many reports of people saying, oh, they can either see the infrared light from the camera or they just know the wood so well that they can spot a camera and know that it's something to avoid. So I decided, all right, well, we'll put it off camera. That way maybe you'll feel safer and come closer. Apparently, no. However, the apple that's missing is behind this tree here, hidden from the camera and nowhere near the camera. And that one's gone. I'd really love for someone who believes squirrels are taking their apples to tell me why that one's been hanging there for two days. And it's untouched. That night, the weather took a really nasty turn and the temperature dropped to below freezing. We had to cancel our night stakeout because it was simply too cold, so we stayed huddled by the fire. About an hour after it got dark, we suddenly started hearing the sound of branches breaking from the trees around our campsite. It would happen sporadically and sounded as if something heavy was moving around the camp and staying just out of sight. It could have easily been a bear or an elk or a deer. There's plenty of evidence they were very active in the area. But then we heard a sound no animal in North America could possibly make. Alright, I know you guys can't see anything. Maybe you can hear it if you're really quiet. Something's knocking wood on wood, not too far from our camp. You see anything on the night vision? Nope. You heard it too, right? I, I mean, I heard something kind of faint, but I'm not sure. I know she heard it for sure. You heard it, Laura? Mm-hmm. I know you can't see anything, but hopefully you guys can hear it if it sounds again. I feel like I hear things over there now. I don't know if you guys do. It's hard with the wind. Yeah. Like with true. the wind on yeah. top of the trees howling a bit. When putting this trip together, our original plan had been to buy several microphones to leave running around the campsite and record the sound of anything moving around us. However, infographics didn't exactly provide the necessary budget. So, no microphones. And this would have been the perfect time to have them. We didn't want to push away whatever might be prowling the edge of our campsite. So we remained around the fire talking but keeping a careful ear out for more sounds. After 20 minutes, we heard something grunt at us from the tree line around the camp in an extremely ape-like fashion. I had given the night vision to Lauren because she was sitting facing in the direction of all the activity, but she never used them before so she wasn't sure how to work them. After the grunting sound, she started scanning the tree line with them and I reminded her to make sure she was recording. Now this next piece of evidence is by far the most controversial and there's several reasons for that. One is the fact that I hadn't properly trained Lauren on how to use night vision. So when she hit the record button, she thought she was in video mode and instead was in photo mode. Next is when she captured the image that she did, the night vision was at maximum magnification, leading to a huge loss in resolution. And here is what she captured. To tell you the truth, I don't know what this image is. It looks like the classic blob squatch, and you can see what appears to be a cone-shaped head, one left arm, and a very large bulky torso, which matches the common description of Bigfoot. When she captured it, even Lauren herself said as she was staring at it that she thought maybe it was just the way the lights and shadows were playing through the faraway tree branches. Thinking that she was recording video, she turned away from the figure for a few moments and then swung back, figuring that, like my fake Bigfoot face that scared the daylights out of me the night before, if this was just weird trees, then the figure would still be there. I can only tell you what she told us because again, she wasn't recording video, even though she thought she was. Upon swinging back to look at the same spot, the figure was gone. Interestingly, we also stopped hearing anything coming from the tree line. 
So, was it weird shadows? Honestly, could very well be, except we couldn't find them again. It's also very coincidental that after this mysterious blob disappeared, we also stopped hearing any more sounds around us. That wouldn't be the only weirdness that night, though. Alright, show me the walkie again. Alright, this walkie's off and it keeps beeping at us. Yep, the walkie's off and yet it keeps beeping. And the other one's over here. And the other walkie's there. Not being touched. We were sitting here around the fire and clearly heard the walkie-talkie go off twice. Couldn't have been that one. What? It's right there. I'm just gonna keep this one here. You guys, put that one there too. And this one was oh, in no, the tent. Oh, okay. Because it beeps. I'm fire because it's cursed. <laughs> yeah. It's fine, they don't work oh, anyway. Thank you. I got about enough oh, of this. this. Honestly, I don't know what to tell you guys. The walkie-talkie was turned off inside a tent and kept going off as if someone was calling to it, followed by the brief sound of static. Maybe Bigfoot was trying to radio us to ask that we don't eat all the s'mores. After breakfast the next morning, our camp got hit by a huge waft of very stinky sewer-like smell. It was coming from west of our camp in the direction of all the sounds we've been hearing the day before. So Emily and I took off to investigate, knowing that a skunky smell is a commonly reported sign of a Bigfoot. I smell it now. Really slight, actually. Yeah? Yeah. My nose is too stuffed up, I can't smell anything. Yeah, I'm so shocked when I came. Wow, how crazy is that? That was like, it really hit me. He said it smelled like garbage. Like garbage and We followed Emily's nose because mine was completely stuffed up, which is why I sound congested in most of these vids. It made me think like a big animal just pooped in front of me while a dumpster was there. <laughs> It's interesting, this is the exact direction where those moaning howls came from last night. Oh yeah. Well, isn't the direction of the print of love? The first one that we found, yeah. yeah. yeah this is what people underestimate all the time. It's how difficult it is to see animals. Yeah, it's so true. We've been out here, what, four days and haven't seen any deer even, and there's tracks everywhere. Yeah, we come across fresh tracks all the time. And the closest we got was that bear last night, or yesterday. We saw two chipmunks in front of all animals. <laughs> Do you hear that? Yeah. Where'd they come from? Yeah. All right. We don't have the gun on us. Yeah. I was thinking that. We should. That was weird though. It was just like two steps and then Hold on a sec. I'm going to try to zoom in. see it. There is one tree that's moving way more than the other trees. It's slowing down now, but you see straight ahead in that gap between the two pines? Oh yeah, I guess so. There's a tree behind them and it was moving pretty violently like a moment ago. The camera can't pick up that detail. Yeah, as much as we're out here to find a pig fight, we're also out here to live. <laughs> we're also unarmed, and it could be a bear just as much as a pig fight. Wait, I do, I do see the tree. It's moving again. Back there, the leaves are moving. Oh fuck me! Stay here. I'm gonna get closer.
All right, I'm not going in there unarmed. I don't see anything, but I'm not going in there on It's a good thing the girlfriend wasn't with me because she would have killed me herself if I tried to get near that shaking tree while unarmed. In the end, we decided that whatever was moving that tree and giving off the skunky sewer smell could be a bear as much as a Bigfoot and decided to head back to camp. We made the decision that morning that we had to cut our trip short. The night before, the temperature dipped way below freezing and stayed that way until 9 a.m. or so. Plus, we could see a very nasty looking weather system moving in. We just weren't prepared to deal with that much weather and decided it was better to be safe than sorry. Before leaving though, we went on one last hike north of our campsite. As soon as we got to the gravel road that was several hundred meters north of our camp, we found yet another massive, freshly torn down branch thrown to the side of the road. So we found another. It's definitely a branch because of the way it's flat on one side. It's not a tree. Still pretty fresh. We actually moved it. It was originally laying lengthwise this way over here. And the thing is, it doesn't actually match any of the trees around here because these two are the only trees of the same species. But this branch is way too big to have come from any of them. So it could only have come from a much, much larger tree that's just not anywhere near here. Because all the trees over here are the wrong types. So this might have been one of the breaks that we heard last night. My question is what in the world dragged this all the way over here? Sadly, that was the end of my Bigfoot challenge. For the second time in infographics history, I was almost eaten by a bear, a detail the girlfriend will only find out about when this video goes live because she'll end up freaking out. When I got home, I gave her a big ol' hug, and after giving me a huge kiss, she immediately pulled away with a loud, yeah, because I hadn't showered in five days, and it smelled like it. She practically put me through a hazmat decontamination before I was allowed to cuddle with her and tell her about my trip. Now, she's a big skeptic about Bigfoot, but when looking at the big picture, even she had trouble explaining all the things we mm -hmm. documented and experienced, and that's really the thing about it all. Individually, each piece of evidence can be disputed, but on the whole, there's not a single skeptical explanation that can account for all of the phenomenon together. Oversized, man-shaped tracks with soil depth impossible to recreate in the same area as ape-like grunts, yelps, and howls, freshly torn off tree branches, some of them weighing 100 pounds or more, deposited in areas nowhere near matching trees, wood knocking sounds and trees being pushed over in traditional ape-like intimidation display behavior, put it all together, it's very difficult to explain how all this anomalous phenomenon was occurring in the exact same area at the exact same time. I'm not saying we discovered evidence of Bigfoot in Central Oregon. I didn't personally see one, so it would be irresponsible to make that claim. What I am saying, however, is that a phenomenon exists in Central Oregon that just so happens to recreate phenomenon reported for hundreds of years and attributed to Bigfoot. Almost a billion people are born every decade, and all those people want a juicy hamburger just as bad as you. Only problem is we're running out of farmland. That's where your favorite lab rat comes in, as we challenge him to teach us how humans in the future may live with an all-bug diet. Alright Info fans, the show is clearly running low on COVID-friendly ideas, and maybe they took inspiration from one of my wilderness survival challenges, but now they've got me on an all-insect diet for 7 days. At least I gotta pick my insects to eat, which let me tell you, doesn't really help much. Here's the thing, I have no idea what kind of insect foods there even are, so I had to do some research online for a sort of daily meal guide. The show turned me on to EdibleInsects.com, which is more than happy to provide you all your delicious insect needs and I made infographics pay dearly for the challenge with some primo grade crickets, mealworms, and even scorpions, plus a few other surprises. I bet some of you are practically retching already at the idea of an insect diet, but truth is, it's kind of all protein to me. Now, the girlfriend on the other hand, well, let's just say she about flew back home to stay with her parents for the duration. I had to very carefully explain that the insects were already dead. I think all of you know just how well she does with creepy crawlies. So how'd my bug diet go? 
For breakfast every day, I decided that even for me, my first meal of the day would have to be a little easy to get down. There's a sort of a sticker shock when you open up a delivery box full of recently dead insects that still look, well, like insects. So I bought some cricket protein powder, which is exactly what it sounds like, the ground up dust of thousands of crickets. They're cricket wives, cricket children, cricket parents, and cricket grandparents. Honestly, cricket protein tastes just as terrible as any other regular protein powder on the market. To make it edible, I mixed it with various fruits into a nice smoothie each morning and threw in some flax seeds because, honestly, I don't know, the girlfriend puts flax seeds in every breakfast item ever and swears by them. But I'll be damned if I know what flax seeds honestly do for you. Chicks love flax seeds though, so into the smoothie they go. At that point, my daily breakfast tasted, well, like a smoothie. Honestly, you could start using cricket protein powder right now and not taste a difference between that and any other protein powder. Smoothies famously leave me feeling rather hungry though, so I was very concerned about lunch, because I just couldn't seriously consider that insects would be enough to leave me satisfied, like a nice juicy burger. I was wrong. Alright, lunchtime was my first real challenge in downing my all-insect diet, because now the food actually looked like, you know, insects. I'm a fan of lettuce wraps of all kinds, so I got myself a nice head of butter lettuce and a box of dead crickets for my first lunch. You can actually buy yourself a pound of crickets for about 40 bucks, which sounds like an outrageous price until you consider the absolute bonkers amount of calories and protein packed into each tiny dead cricket body. 100 grams of crickets contains almost three times the protein of an equal amount of moo cow beef. It also has less saturated fat, though not by a lot to be honest, and way more carbohydrates. Just two tablespoons of these bad boys contain a whopping 90 calories. So everyone touting the insect diet hopefully eats in moderation because these bad boys will get you fat pretty quick. So I roasted my crickets in some butter, salt, and pepper and squeezed lime juice on them and ladled them into my lettuce cups. By this point, the girlfriend looked absolutely green in the face and she dry heaved the first time she saw the crickets sizzling in the pan. Because, of course, nobody goes in and plucks off their tiny little heads or legs and stuff before packaging. You get the whole cricket and these things look like they were killed just yesterday. Like I said, serious sticker shot content. I took a bite of my first lettuce cup and the girlfriend actually rushed out of the room dry heaving when several dead crickets spilled out of my lettuce cup as I sunk my teeth in. You know what? Crickets taste earthy? I don't know. I've eaten one or two in the wild before during some of my survival challenges or when doing wilderness survival training, but I never really had enough to get a real taste of them in my mouth. There's a lot of crunching though, which was oddly satisfying, but also served to remind me that I was eating a mouthful of bugs. What was really annoying was the way their tiny little legs get stuck between your teeth and their antennas kind of get left behind when you swallow. You ever have a hair in your mouth? It's a lot like that. And you end up spitting out bug antennas for a half hour after you're done eating. Immediately after my first lunch, I went to try and get a kiss from the girlfriend, but she was having absolutely none of that. I chased her around the house and tried to pin her down, but she slipped away and locked herself in the bathroom. She made it very clear there'd be no kissing this entire week. Other lunches throughout the week included even more crickets, which honestly are kind of limited in the ways you can prepare them. Seems like roasting them is pretty much it. The key is pairing them with something complimentary, not pasta. Believe me, insects do not go well with pasta, but I'd find out about that soon enough. Other lunches included black ants, which you can buy by the boatful. I sizzled them up with some peas and carrots. Honestly, ants just kind of took the place of rice in my meals. The real pièce de résistance, however, came on Friday, my last lunch of the challenge, in which I treated myself to tarantula. Now, ants and crickets are pretty economically priced, but tarantula is basically the filet mignon of the insect world. I ended up billing the show 20 bucks for two tarantulas, which had to be flown in from Thailand directly and cost a whopping $30 in shipping charges. Also, they took two weeks to get here, so I ordered them well in advance of the challenge. Okay, my tarantula lunch ended up being an expensive disaster. Let me explain. First, I don't know if you knew this, but I am not a bug cuisine master chef. I have done some very rudimentary research and just kind of winged it with my preparation of most of the meals. So for instance, I had no idea you were supposed to remove the abdomen from the tarantula. And believe me, you want to remove the abdomen from the tarantula. I cannot explain the horrors I experienced biting into a big, fat tarantula abdomen. Hey, I figured that's where all the meat was. I was wrong. That was where all the terror was. Think overstuffed jelly donut exploding outwards on your face, only not delicious jelly at all, just disgusting bug guts jelly. 
Also, I didn't know you were supposed to singe off the tarantula hairs. Some tarantulas use those fine hairs as defensive weapons, so imagine how wonderful it felt to have a bunch of them get stuck in my throat. Alright, mistakes were made, but I battered and fried my tarantulas up following a recipe I found online. This was paired with some nice plum sauce, then lightly salted. You know how I've been talking about sticker shock throughout this episode? Well, nothing compares to the sticker shock of a full-grown tarantula sitting on your plate. Unless it's two full-grown tarantulas sitting on your plate ready for you to chomp down. When the girlfriend saw it, she actually got lightheaded and I thought she was going to faint. She promptly walked out of the kitchen. She couldn't even bear to watch me eat these giant eight-legged freaks. So, how'd they taste? Well, I feel like I have the palate of a potato farmer sometimes because honestly, it was kind of bland to me. Like unseasoned chicken. Unlike most of the other bugs I had this week though, the meat was actually kind of chewy, especially in the legs. I'll admit though, I couldn't do it. Eating dead spiders the size of my palm was just too much. Alright, for day snacks throughout the week, I actually got a bunch of insect bars, which is basically what it sounds like. They're sort of like granola bars, but way edgier. Think crickets and mealworms and other unidentifiable creepy crawlies mixed in there. They're mashed up enough that you can't really tell what you're eating. And the addition of vanilla or nuts or chocolate basically masks any insect taste. Again, another good way to ease yourself into the bug diet. Another surprisingly tasty snack was chocolate covered scorpions, though sadly they did not have their stingers and were kind of tiny. I was hoping for a scorpion as big as my hand, but though I hear you can get them, they're also pretty expensive. Dinner is my favorite meal of the day, but my first dinner would end in disaster. Now, maybe I still have some of my youthful, childlike wonder in me, but when I thought about insect diet, I immediately thought about worm spaghetti. I mean, honestly, what could go better together? Sadly, you can't get really long worms unless you just buy a case of night crawlers from a bait shop. But even that seemed like too much for me. So I settled on smaller meal worms and basically fried them up with olive oil, some rosemary, and thyme and dumped them into a pot of spaghetti. This was a mistake. The slippery consistency of the spaghetti did not complement the crunchiness of the meal worms in the expected way. It just sort of made me think of big fat night crawlers in my mouth. Or maybe I just had that image already because I was originally thinking about them. Either way, this was the only meal the whole week where I legitimately heaved and almost barfed. The whole thing went into the trash. Absolutely no thank you. I did find a recipe online for a BLT, which immediately sold me because puns are life. Turns out you don't actually get adult bees, which I guess makes sense, and instead you get bee larvae when you order a bag of edible bees. Now preparing this was kind of tricky. First I sautéed the larvae in butter with a few drops of honey. Then I mixed them with egg white and put the whole thing back in the pan to solidify it. Now I had a sort of uh, bee steak held together by egg white, so I flopped that on top of some lettuce and tomato and boom, my very first BLT ever. The girlfriend was far less delighted at my creation than I was. Honestly, at this point in the week, she was basically queasy and green every single day. How'd it taste? Listen, I knew going in that once this challenge was over, I wasn't going to be turning to an insect diet. Literally, none of these meals were going to make it into my real life meal plans. Bee larvae might have changed my mind. Those chubby little things basically live their whole lives in honey. It's all they eat. So not only are they plump, but when you bite into them, they have this nice sweet taste. It's like candy, but not as sugary or overly sweet. Honestly, it's just right. I love this so much that I actually roasted more of those bad boys up. In honey, of course then dusted them with some sea salt and stuck them in a bag for a fantastic snack. Out of all the bugs I've eaten, these things are definitely staying. Well, that is if I can get the girlfriend to come around to it. She has really suffered through this whole week, to the point that she was non-jokingly thinking about staying with a friend after the third day. She's been nauseated at basically every meal, and we quickly had to start eating apart, which I really didn't like because sitting down to a meal together is one of my favorite things. I told her about the bee larvae and she was not having it. I think she just needs time away from seeing me cooking up all kinds of bugs and worms every day of the week. Maybe in a month or two she'll come around. But you should be buying a bee larvae like yesterday, because trust me, it's pretty much aces. Now go check out Eat Only What I Catch for 72 hours, or click this other video instead.